I think it'll stop as soon as we get going. People will be on. Now we're on YouTube Live. We're good. Yep. Fine says so streaming. People will be on. Okay. Now we're on YouTube Live. That's weird. All right. So I'm going to admit everyone. I'm going to. Thomas. Okay, are we ready? Do we have everybody in now, Leah? I still see five, four people waiting. I'm guessing we're gonna to continue to have people coming in. I mean, I don't think they'll come in right immediately. Yeah, seven. That's probably true. Okay, let's go ahead and get started and Leah can just admit people as they continue to pop up. Um, so welcome everyone. Let's go ahead and we'll start as we always do with the Pledge of Allegiance. All right. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United, the States, United of States of America and, and to the republic, republic for which, for which, it, which stands. it stands, one nation, one nation under, under, under God, indivisible, indivisible, indivisible with, liberty, with liberty and justice, and justice for all. For all. Awkward over Zoom. Um, and I've asked uh, Commissioner Wilcox to give us a thought or a prayer, so I will turn the time over to her. Okay. Thank you. Um, ah, I can find it. There we go. Okay, so I've had this for a while, um, so it's kind of um, applicable, but still applicable now. But this is a story that my husband's um, co-worker gave him, and I think it's applicable. It says, when I was in the second or third grade, our school got a new piece of playground equipment, a hand-pushed metal, metal, metal merry-go-round with bent iron bars along the outside you can hang out onto first as you push it and then you wrote it. It was a very scary contraption, but it was a part of the fun. Once you got on, you spin around faster and faster until you couldn't hang on anymore and you'd slingshot off into the dirt in the playground. There were two ways you could get hurt. You'd scrape yourself up when you flew off and when you flew off, you'd sell into kids that were standing there, minding their own business, and they got scraped up. The challenge was to stay on the spinning di metal disc as long as you could. As we tried to do that, we made a crucial discovery. The centrifugal force that tore you off the boards was dramatically reduced as you scooted into the center of the disc. You could sit there and spin for almost as long as you wanted. Right now, our lives may feel like that merry-go-round. So many of us, so many things are, spinning so fast we can barely hang on. We're trying to avoid COVID-19, we're working, we're trying to work from home, we're running a homeschool, self-isolating, isolating, trying to find stuff at the grocery store and we're even had to deal with earthquakes. I can't remember a time when so many things seem to be so out of control, out of our control. The merry-go-round might be starting to slow down, but for many, it can still be out of control. One habit that is, is the equivalent, equivalent of the center can, and can help you feel more in control is gratitude. Looking for things to appreciate can help you feel centered. Being grateful is a choice we can make. And whenever we have a choice, we have control. Your gratitude might involve things you are starting to do with your family or getting support from your work family or trying to FaceTime with your friends. Maybe it's even reading a book or rereading something you enjoy. Unfortunately, this is this isn't the first time, or will it be the last time that many of us will face challenges? But if we remember to have gratitude, our outlook on things can and will change. There's a short line in Victor Frank Frankel's great book, Man's Search for Meaning. He talks about life in, his, in the Nazi concentration camp where he was in prison during World War II. He says, I forced my thoughts to turn to another subject. I think that we can find serenity now in this time as we can find gratitude in our hearts. So, and then do I just say the prayer? Yes. Okay. Okay. Dear Holy Father, we are so grateful at this time to meet together to help this city. And also at this time, we bless that we will be able to 
figure out what is best for the citizens and for this city and bless that we'll have thy guidance in all that we do. And we are grateful for all that we have and also bless us through that this time with this um, virus that we'll be able to be protected and comforted in all that we do. And we say these things in the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, great, great thought given everything that we have going on. Um, Okay, so I understand there are quite a few people that are here um, participating and watching our meeting tonight. So a couple of administrative things before we turn to our commission business. Um, there are two items on our agenda, two substantive items, both having to deal with the hive. There's a request for a conceptual site plan approval and there is a request for a conditional use permit. I understand that Commissioner Hunt would like to disclose a conflict. And so I will turn the time over to him. Uh, yeah, thanks everyone. Um, I just want to, I guess, officially recuse myself from, nope. from voting on You're this muted, project. Friend. What's that? Am I not, am I still Can muted? Mute? You're not yeah. muted. Okay, I didn't think I was muted, but um, yeah, I, I would like to just recuse myself from this project. Um, I guess on two accounts. One, I, I have property that is adjacent to to this project and um, my work, my boss's brothers with the developer. Um, and I just think it would be best for me to, to recuse myself from this. So I will sign out and watch on YouTube and, and uh, look forward to listening to y'all. So thank you. Thank, thank you very much. And we'll have you pop back in after both of those agenda items are done. We have a third item on our agenda with regards to approval of the minutes. Okay. okay, sounds great. Thank you. Thank you very much. So let's talk about how we are going to facilitate this public comment process. We're doing this through Zoom. This is new for everyone. So I wanted to, before we get started, walk through for all of those who are watching how this is going to work. So the first thing is that in order to facilitate um, public commentary in an orderly fashion, what I'm going to do is I have a list of, I can see a list of all of the participants that are in this meeting based on what they've put into the system as to what their name is. So I am going to announce who it is that's gonna be speaking and then I will identify who the person um, next is gonna speak up on deck, um, so to speak. So please listen and when you're called and you're given time to speak, please go ahead and speak. And if you're on deck, um, please be waiting and be prepared to give your comments person before you is done. Uh, please, Jaylen, yes. Uh, perhaps, do you think there that everyone, are you gonna go through everyone's name and they can just say if they don't wanna speak? Yes, they may that's exactly speak. right. Okay. Yep, so if somebody doesn't wanna speak, that's fine, but I am literally just gonna go through person by person because there's no other real way for me to determine, you know, I wanna make sure that everybody has had the opportunity to speak. Um, I would remind everyone that is a member of the public to please keep your video off until it is time for you to speak. You are welcome once it's your turn to speak. You can put on the video if you would like. If you would prefer to just do that via audio, um, audio is fine. If you are watching this meeting live on YouTube, please mute the YouTube live stream when you're giving your comments um, because otherwise there's a wicked feedback and that interferes. So when it's your turn to speak, please just make sure that you're muting your live YouTube if you're watching it also on live YouTube. Um, I don't know if there's a way for any of y'all to go back and write in your full names. I have a lot of first names, so I'll just um, go based on that. When you are called on to speak, please make sure that you start your comments by introducing uh, yourself with your full name and what your city of residence is for the record. And I'll remind um, you if you forget to do that. Shayla, In, yes. If you, uh, for the public, if you'd like to rename your your Can screen, you, rename it? you just go to the dot 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 on the screen that's by yours, the top right of your screen, and it says rename right there under there. You can push that and then rename it. Perfect. That would help me out if people want to insert their last names, but if not, um, we'll make it work. In order to allow all members of the public who are interested in commenting to have time to comment, you're gonna be given five minutes 
up to five minutes to make your comments. And so we just ask you to please respect the time limits that you've been given. Um, if, if you take advantage of that, I may ask our host to mute you if you go on too long past five minutes. So just try to be cognizant of that so that we can make sure that everybody has the opportunity to, to share their thoughts. There was a notice that went out in our packet that said that you will be removed from the Zoom meeting once your comments have been given. So there has been a change to that procedure. So if, if you do have the ability to watch the live stream on YouTube, it would help us if once you've given your comment that you can remove yourself from the Zoom meeting and then watch via the, via the live YouTube stream. Um, but if you do need to remain in the Zoom reason for some reason after you've given your comments, please just let us know so that we can make um, a note of that. In the event that anybody has technical difficulties, so if you're giving your comments and your internet gets laggy or you, you, or you start to cut out and we're not able to hear you, don't panic. What we will do is we'll just put you back um, and allow you to finish working out your issues and then we can unmute you and we'll hear you again. So if you do have technical issues, please um, don't panic. So we have two items on our agenda. Both of them are pertaining to the Hive. So what we're gonna do in order to try to streamline this process, given that we previously had noticed both matters for a public hearing, what we're gonna do is ask our staff to address both items at the same time. So staff will address the first item and then they will address the second item. Then the applicant will be afforded an opportunity to speak to both agenda items. And then we will open a single public hearing and allow members of the public who wish to speak to either matter, the first matter, the second matter, or both matters um, to speak. And then we'll conclude by allowing the applicant to respond to any public comments. Can you also, Shaylin, can you also clarify uh, a lot of times when public comments occur, some people um, ask a question, they want us to immediately answer them. Um, that's, this is not the process that public comment, how public comment goes. You're, so why don't Shaylin, why don't you just explain how that would work? There are actually two things that I was getting to that, so I appreciate it. The first is that we are not going to be making any substantive decisions tonight. Um, this is our opportunity as a planning commission to listen to the applicant's proposal and to listen to any public comments. So we are planning on discussing the substance of this proposal after we've had the opportunity to listen to comments and then there's going to be an opportunity for people to submit written comments before we start debating. With regards to questions, if you do have questions, I've instructed our staff to take down those notes. We're going to make notes of those questions and then we'll plan on substantively addressing any questions that are raised at the next um, at the next meeting. So I do recognize that we have a lot of people here and a lot of people who are meaning to speak because we're going to be continuing this meeting over until the next meeting on May 27th. Um, what I'm going to do is we're going to accept comments through 10 p.m. and at 10 p.m. we're going to table any further discussions if there are public comment that still needs to come in. And you're welcome to go ahead and provide comments at our next um, public hearing. At the conclusion of the meeting, if you want to speak, that's great. If you would prefer to submit written comments to us, you're certainly welcome to do that. Um, you're welcome to submit your comments to our city recorder and you can do that either through email or you can do that through mail. And at the end of this, it, there was a, in our packet, there were instructions on how to do that. And at the end of this meeting, um, our city recorder will also be posting that at the end on the screen so that you can jot down that information as well. So please keep in mind that I recognize that there are comments that have already been submitted to us. And so we're gonna have staff gather those comments and any additional comments that come in afterwards. Um, and we'll get those into our next packet on May 27th. So, I want to talk about one more thing. So that's sort of administrative procedurally and hopefully everybody listens so that we can try to, to keep this process moving. Um, but I did want to just sort of for the benefit of anyone who is providing a public comment to, to talk about the fact that we have two matters that are scheduled for administrative decisions. And I think that it might be helpful just to briefly address the distinction between a legislative decision and an administrative decision. So a legislative decision is a decision that establishes a law or a policy, and only our city council is authorized to make 
legislative policy decisions for the city. That is not something that the Planning Commission can do. The Planning Commission handles administrative decisions, which involves applying the law and ordinance to specific applications. We are only authorized to make administrative decisions. The City Council has already made a legislative decision regarding what is permitted and not permitted through the zoning code. So our job as a planning commission is solely to implement those legislative policies that have been enacted by the city council. <clears throat> there is one existing ordinance regarding conditional use permits that I'll just briefly touch on. Um, under zoning code 12-21-100 subsection E2, conditions may be imposed as necessary to prevent or minimize adverse effects upon other property or improvements in the vicinity of a conditional use. That is something that we can consider as a planning commission. So if you believe that the use that is proposed will have an adverse impact that needs to be mitigated, we would encourage you to address that material in your responses and in your public comments. Okay. Well, I think that's it. Sorry, that was a laundry list of things, but again, this is a new process for us. So hopefully if we lay out the ground rules in advance, then we'll just move right along like a well-oiled machine. So thank you for everyone for, for um, bearing with that. So with that, we will go ahead and turn to our first item on the agenda. So we are being asked as again, administrative decision. Um, we're looking at a conceptual site plan, which is the Hive. Um, it's being proposed at 555 North 400 West Street. And then the second item on the agenda is for a conditional use permit. So I will turn the time over to staff to address both um, of those items. Okay, thank you, Chair Heyman. Members of the commission, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, and you should see a screen share. Do you see the screen share? Yes. Okay, um, the details of the staff report are in your packet, and I've attempted to just quickly summarize those uh, comments in the staff report for the record for before the commission and uh, introduce uh, the matters by zoning ordinance that we've reviewed and some of our uh, preliminary findings uh, for the project. It's down here. Not going to my next page, there we go. All right, uh, this, I won't go over the details on this sheet. This is just uh, the summary of the sheet or flyer that's been in your packet and sent around to the public. And so this is communication about the project. It is the Centerville Mobile Home Estates. Um, it is an existing property and, uh, and summarizes the development. So that's just information that was already in uh, a packet. Uh, the property, I've just put an aerial photo uh, off of Google Earth. Here is the uh, manufactured home park. I believe there is 53 trailer pads, um, well, 51 trailer pads and uh, 48 in use. I don't know if that's accurate. That's the, that's the approximate information that we found. Uh, this is north of Parish Lane. At the bottom of the screen, you can see the Chick-fil-A to the left. We have the MTC buildings and parking deck in the center, and you have the Performing Arts Center on the right, and the manufactured home park is sitting just north in that area of yellow. Uh, in the packet, you have the, uh, the applicant's submittal for their site plan. So here is the, the overlay on top of that property that uh, they're looking to redevelop uh, the manufactured park. On the north end of the project, you see some gray squares. Uh, those are the uh, twin homes or duplexes, um, but they're attached single family to a piece in each building. Um, you also have to the south, um, another use type is the uh, townhomes, mainly consisting of fourplexes. Now uh, you do have, I think, a sixplex on the west end of the project, but that gives you the the layout. Uh, just for information, this is the base zoning. The property is currently zoned residential high. So it's in a residential high district. That's our highest uh, intensity use zone that we have for residential development. The zoning description, I've put that up there. This is a uh, zone that allows multiple family 
Um, the desire is to create uh, multi multifamily at, uh, in a well-designed manner and to consider densities in the project of eight to 12 units per acre. And you've discussed that, Chair Heyman, uh, that part of this includes a conditional use. So if you look at the allowable density, the RH by right, this means that any person owning property in a residential high, if they meet the development standards, they're allowed a, a minimum amount of eight units per acre. Where there's, uh, that's permitted, that's allowed, and, and they're allowed to do that. There is a, a, a second part in the RH zone, that's the conditional use density you spoke of. Uh, you can add additional density through the CUP and the range is nine to 12 units, maxing out at 12 units. As you can see the uh, zoning, just a map of the zoning, up to the north, the yellowish colors with the individual house addresses, that's the single family zone. The yellow is a residential low zone. The orange where you see the manufactured park is currently zoned RH, that is the orange type color. To the south, you do see two different zones. The Performing Arts Center is in the public facility high and the MTC and Chick-fil-A and McDonald's across the street is in our commercial very high. And so you can see that uh, there are various zones and this is a, a transition zone between single family and commercial development. Uh, just brief, I know you repeated it already, Chair Heyman, but just, just maybe a second go at it. This is a conceptual site plan review. This is an administrative uh, decision. We're gonna look at the zoning ordinance, see what the zoning ordinance says and apply what the zoning ordinance says to the, to the development. Again, it's not a legislative decision. And I know that there are comments that are in the social media. And I got a call again today just for clarification, this is not requesting a rezone. The property is currently zoned RH and they're developing it as RH. So it is not a rezone. What is a conceptual site plan? This is the beginning step. This is not really a decision at this point to, to enact a development. Uh, it is a chance to give the feedback from the planning commission and staff and the public to look at the RH zoning and the applicable standards and give the applicant some feedback on how close they are to meeting those standards. The actual decision to allow development would come at a later date, a second step, which would be a final site plan application. So you have to cross through this conceptual first to have a discussion on what it takes for the development to likely meet the RH zone they will have to submit an additional application to the planning commission. Table of uses in the RH zone, uh, both housing types, twin homes or duplexes and townhomes are both allowable dwelling types in the RH zone. Again, permitted density is eight units an acre, conditional density is nine to 12. We do reference our uh, process to look at the general plan. Uh, this is already zoned residential high, so the decision to apply it has already been enacted legislatively by the city council. But just for understanding, this is a transition zone. It's, it's the goal of the general plan for this neighborhood to bring higher densities closer to the commercial and, tra and, and transition densities away from the commercial through the various zones until you get to single family. This is, uh, is one of those transition zones, zones used by the city. Uh, multifamily projects, PUDs, that's a planned unit development with private roads or other similar types of projects are permitted only on parcels three acres or larger. And this parcel is over six acres. And so this parcel does qualify to meet the general plan expectations. Uh, Residential design standards, I, I kind of skipped the base because we can cover a lot of the issues through the other elements. So I'll get back to the base zone. But the design standards are, on, are in addition to the base zone uh, standards. Uh, a couple, a few years back, if you remember the Hafoka development out on Porter Lane, there was concerns that the city did not have design standards with multifamily. Subsequently, the city did adopt those standards since that time, 
And the project now has these additional design standards in the RH zone to meet. Our findings is that it does comply with the exterior standards of the ordinance. We also find that it complies with providing both active and passive spaces in the project, multifamily project. We also find that it complies with the public private access design standards for the most part. However, we do bring up a couple of issues. So I've got these question marks that sit at the bottom of the slide. The ordinance requires uh, visitor parking at a half a stall per unit. If you notice the design of these projects, the twin homes will have a two car garage. The town homes will also have a two car garage. The uh, twin homes have a driveway deep enough to park cars in it. So there's visitor parking available within the driveways of the, of the uh, twin homes. However, the, uh, the multifamily has a two car garage, but it's served by alleys and alleys are limited to create a circulation access of the vehicle to the garage, but don't function as parking. And so that's one of the issues we raise is that the street's wide enough to have some on-street parking, but it would be limited on the north side of the street due to the driveways of the twin homes. The south side of the street, in between the alleys, you might be able to park a few vehicles, but our concern a little bit is um, the function of making sure that fire access is cleared at 20 feet through the project. That would be one side of the street parking. One side of the street parking does create sometimes some headaches when, when people disobey the rules and park on the other side of the street and we lose that, that circulation through. And they do provide 12 additional stalls down by the amenities, the sports court area, but we think that there maybe should a little effort to address the town home visitor parking. And, and so we just raise that as we question whether that's fully functional. Um, the other question that we have is that the architectural design meets our standards, but one thing that we call out is the final design needs to be reviewed by an architect for its design features. I am sure they might have an in-house architect, maybe they can, we can ask them, but we just raise it right now, they're preliminary, but a architect is required to look at the design plan. Here's the proposed architecture. We do not address the shapes of buildings in our, in our codes, but we do address the materials. Uh, as I said, we found that the materials comply, but you have your duplex or townhomes or twin homes on the left, and you have your townhome design on the right, and you're seeing an elevation that is on the other side of the building. The far elevation is where your two-car garage parking would be. Uh, just we highlight, they did provide the provo uh, proposed passive and active places. If you look at the townhomes, they do have the garden court on in between on the other side of the alleys. And so there is your some of your gathering and passive place uh, for spaces for individuals to, to be outside. Um, they also are using some of their monument space and some of their landscaping is some passive design. If you look at their active spaces, they do provide a, uh, I think they're pickleball courts, if I recall right, and a pavilion and a gathering area. So as a park-like setting within the project, this would be available for the residents in the project in addition to the city parks that they can drive to. The, uh, the Now I'll return quickly back to the base zone standards or maybe a question of height. If you recall in the zoning, the single family height is a 35 foot limit. The residential high zone is also a 35 foot height limit. And the plans of the townhomes and the twin homes will satisfy that 35 foot height maximum height. So uh, keep in mind the commercial zones are 45 feet high. So we do have a transition of heights of these buildings down to a residential level and I think that's uh, uh, in compliance with our expectations. Um, this is a single site development at this point in time. It's kind of an odd shape because you have accesses off of two different front, you have the frontage road and the 400 west. Our front yard setbacks are 25 and 20 respectively. So I think they just need to adjust 
the setbacks on one of the streets to a 20 foot setback rather than the 15 foot. Um, the other thing we noticed in the plans is they do show quite a bit of landscape area, but we do not know whether it meets the 40% landscaping requirement for non single family projects. It's possible and it seems likely, but we need that calculation just to be sure that we have uh, that open space and active space percentages of landscaping equaling 40%. They propose some of their landscape design themes throughout the project. They also, oh, and, and so that, that I address the, just the site plan, that's in summary. Um, now you've asked to look at the conditional use permit. So I'll just add our review to, to our site plan. I, I mean, our, our conclusion is, is we think it very much uh, complies substantially with the RH development standards with the adjustments we talked about. The conditional use, this is now the opportunity to, for the developer to request and add nine to 12 units. Uh, they are adding up to 80 units. So that would be a 12 unit per acre calculation. So they do need to ask for this conditional use permit to achieve the, the maximum density they're proposing. Just again, this is an administrative action. Um, it's not a legislative action and it's not a rezone. Um, just as uh, chair repeated, the, the Planning Commission's role is to impose conditions necessary to minimize or mitigate any identified impacts. The Planning Commission can also request additional information to, to, to be sure about that. So that's something different than the permitted zone. The permitted, if they meet the standards, they get it by default. The conditional use they get under state law provided that they mitigate the impacts. If they can mitigate, mitigate the impacts, then we're obligated to approve it. So I think that's important for the commission to, 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 to listen to the public, look at the plans and see if there may be some matters that need some mitigation. And then once you've identified those matters of mitigation, um, if they can reasonably meet those mitigation measures required under the conditional use permit, then we are obligated to approve the conditional use. So that third part, a conditional use shall be approved. It's not an option to approve. We have to approve it if they mitigate. So from a staff perspective, what are we looking at from our perspective of mitigating? Uh, we do, we did ask our city engineer about traffic. We know that there is some planned improvements being made to Parish Lane for a double northbound left at 400 West. There's also a, a double northbound uh, left at Marketplace or leading to the frontage road. We also know that there'll be that double left on frontage road will terminate over by the Chick-fil-A. So we've had some discussions with the developer about uh, if we add this ad additional density, does the nine to 12 units create an additional impact that get, could be, needs to be mitigated? Our city engineer says it will probably be a very low threshold that they create an impact, but I think it's something that the planning commission can weigh in and have the developer uh, look at a traffic study and determine whether this nine to 12 additional units creates an impact that they would need to mitigate. And if it does create an impact, how extent is that impact and, and to what extent can it be mitigated? Uh, so I think that's something the commission can look at. Uh, fire access and circulation. Uh, we have the capacity for the fire service to in the fire flows. They do have a 30 foot wide private street. Uh, they, they do have plans to put in the required hydrants. The only question that we have is this visitor parking. Is it, is it adequate to have sufficient visitor parking and still keep the private road open for fire apparatus? access because this is a this is a long enough road that fire apparatus will have to enter into the property in an emergency situation and we want to make sure we keep that so i think that's something to look at and have the fire district weigh in on what would be their recommendation utilities and drainage they do have a utility preliminary utility plan the utilities are present and available for the project 
Um, they do have a small detention area on the west end of the project at the entrance. Uh, there's no calculations on, permit, given on that detention. Uh, they're aware that they need to provide stormwater detention, but I think it comes down to what is the size of that detention basin and does it affect the layout? Do we need more space than they're proposing? And we don't know until we get a preliminary need for stormwater. So I think that's something that could be looked at during the conditional use permit to make sure that they adequately size that. Not only will they have to do it for the eight units, but the additional nine to 12 will have to happen too. Uh, again, with the parking and circulations, we're just, we've seen one side of the street parking and enforcement and some issues associated with it. They do have a wide street, it's 30 feet. It's not narrow like we've seen in the past but we just wanna make sure that the, the visitor parking is addressed. So we think that's something to look at under the conditional use. Um, so this basically will summarize our findings uh, to this point. Uh, we're just recommending that you don't make a decision tonight, that you host the public hearing, that you table till your May 27th meeting, receive those written comments. We will assemble them together with the city recorder and get them to you in a packet for those who do respond and give you a chance to view those. And also if you have anything uh, tonight that you would like to give some guidance to the developer, you're welcome to provide that tonight. But with that, that concludes our presentation. Thank you very much, Corey. Does anyone have any questions for staff? Corey, I have one quick question, just as a clarification. You've kind of already addressed this a little bit, but when it comes to the CUP, one of our instructions or what you talked about was uh, mitigating the impacts of, uh, and then, well, what I want to clarify is what we're mitigating the impact of. We're not mitigating the impact of the first eight units per acre. We're mitigating the impact of the additional nine through 12, correct? That is correct. The imp if you create, if, if you deem that there's an impact, the, that to deem that it has to be centered around the additional nine to 12 units. Okay, so just to, that's something to keep in mind as we're talking about this is what, what is the impact of having those additional units on this land, not the, the base eight units? Correct. Okay, thank you. And Corey, I failed to mention this in my intro. I had meant to and obviously spaced. Um, you had indicated that your recommendation is for us to collect any written comments and then we'll obviously address those at the next planning commission meeting. As I understand it, we're asking for any comments by 5 p.m. on May 21st. So if any member of the public wants to get comments in, please make sure that you've emailed them or dropped them off at City Hall um, or postmark them by May 21st. Yeah, the reason for that deadline is to ensure that it gets in your packet and that you've got a copy of them. Uh, however, if we do have some stragglers, we'll just have to bring them to the meeting, but you may not have read them yet. So I just think if, the, if those who want to provide written comments want to make sure that you get a chance to read them, uh, that deadline is the 21st at five. Thank you. Any other questions for staff? I've got two quick questions, Corey. The first, uh, there was some discussion in the staff report about utility and infrastructure availability. Are, uh, uh, from this engineering standpoint, are, uh, are we good from a sewer storm drain other than the detention, but uh, those types of infrastructure? Uh, good, good question. Um, the utilities are available from a city service to perspective. So your sewer, your water, uh, your major utilities like power and gas are available. The one item that's undefined right now is we require a connection to secondary water for irrigation. And I believe they're in the Dual Creek zone, Dual Creek uh, Secondary Water District. And what we don't know is do they own shares coming with the purchase of the property? And are those shares sufficient or do they need to buy additional shares from Dual Creek? to establish the secondary irrigation. So that's a good question. Okay. We, that, need to know, we need to understand the secondary water. Okay, and then my second question would be, and I don't think there are, but are there any ambiguities that you feel or any issues that uh, you've come up with that may not be 
completely clear from an interpretation of the ordinance? From, from my standpoint, there's not. I do raise a few of the density calculation. Uh, the commission in the past has raised question about how we apply density calculations. So I give you in this report, the clarification on how densities are calculated gross versus net for that precedence. And uh, that precedence has been interpreted, as I said, by the planning commission, looking at those parameters for a long time. So uh, what that would mean in this case is if you differ with the precedence and the interpretation provided in the staff report, it would reduce the number of unit count from 80 to 79. That would be the only potential ambiguity I would see. Okay, thank you. I have a question. Um, in the staff report, you talk about the potential for the PUD for future. Um, can you explain that? And I know that sometimes there are additional um, uh, design standards and different things that apply to the PUD. And I just want to to see if you could walk us through if that were a possibility, as you mentioned it in the staff report, what that would look like, how that might differ from this, or if the process of applying applying for this um, conditional use permit and additional, you know, initial permit, would that lead us directly to the PUD, or is that something? I just want you to talk through that process with us real quick. Sure. Um, so. Kind of setting the standard, this is a this is a single site being developed with multiple dwelling units. And so as a single site, if you were just to develop an apartment complex on a single site, all of them would be under one ownership, the land would be under one ownership, the buildings would be under one ownership. It'd be a single owner or entity is a single owner, and they would rent that complex out. However, often in multifamily, there's an intent to do an ownership. And as my understanding in this project, that's the direction the applicant is, is intending to go. To have these homes owned by people, not rent. Yeah, to have them owned. So there's, there's a way to do that. And it's, it's our ordinances create what we call plan developments in two versions. Uh, the, the first version that's applicable to this project would be called a planned unit development. That's a form of subdivision where they take the single piece of land and they convert areas of that land for sale. So an example would be a think of condominiums. That's, a, that's not the great word to use, but think of condominiums. You can own a section of a-, of a Or like Pinea right next door to it. They have, yeah. they have those, you know, homes and townhomes that are for sale. Yeah, And so on, in our subdivision ordinance, a person that has a single use property can convert that to a planned unit development. And that planned unit development is just simply a way to create the subdivision to allow the units to be sold. The standard of a PUD is the process of a multifamily approval. To get a PUD, you have to get a multifamily approval in this case, an RH zone. So any decisions you make potentially about the project and its development and its layout will govern how the PUD gets created to be subdivided. And, and that's just a conversion for ownership. There is a second plan development overlay, which is different than this project would be. We have a plan development overlay that has ability to forego requirements in certain zones if a developer does a better design than the base zoning. However, at this juncture, for lack of better terms, they're not planning to do something different than the RH zone. And so there's no need to go to the plan development overlay at this point. Okay. That makes sense? Yep, thank you. Yeah. Corey, could you be more specific though on what that better might be if, you know, at this, RH level, what might be better than the base zoning? Um, think of the uh, think of the Maverick and the units over there on the west side of the freeway. So the Maverick and all the residential units in there. Now those are apartment complexes; they're not for sale, but 
But that was a plan development overlay where you had a piece of property that was solely zoned commercial. And in our neighborhood plan for the west side, you can add residential through a plan development overlay. And so that's how the Maverick site was developed with the corner lot commercial and the rest with residential. And in exchange for that, they had to provide open spaces that would normally not be there in a commercial zone. They created a trail connection, which was normally not required in that zone. And they did something above and beyond the base zone. And in exchange for that, we gave them the residential uses in a commercially zoned piece of property. Here, um, I, I don't see in multifamilies there's an advantage to, to do a whole lot of foregoing to a quote a increased design. Um, what I would see is that if there was a variation design of a mixture of uses being proposed, then that's when we would use the PDO overlay to look at the zone, the base zone and other elements and say, okay, if we're going to do a mixture of use types that are not normal to this zone. So an example would be is they wanted to do single family. Single family is not currently allowed. So we'd have to do something to change that. If they wanted to add in some other commercial uses um, and do a mixed development, we'd have to do a PEO or a rezone to do that. But at this point, they're just looking at the RH zone. So I don't see a need to move to a PDO at this point. Okay, and Corey, one more question then uh, about that. Uh, the P, PUD, PDO, do they both have potential for density bonuses or only one or the other? That's what I was gonna ask too. That's a good right. question. Um, can I just weigh in here? I think we have a really long public hearing coming up and uh, I think we've got the, the public waiting. These questions might be better uh, later on because we actually just have a conceptual site plan and a conditional use permit before us tonight. Okay. Whatever, Chair Heyman, I'm, I'm at your beck and call. I will defer to the city attorney on this one. Um, so let's go ahead then and invite the applicant to speak to us. All right. Do you guys have a video? And it looks like Darlene Carter and I'm sorry, I can't tell. If you can just introduce yourself for us. Video would be great if you have it too. Perfect. Hi. Um, can you hear me first off? Yes, if you'll just introduce yourself for us. Okay, great. My name is Darlene Carter. I'm with CW Urban. I have an associate, Dane Smith, with me. He's not in the picture because we're trying to social distance, but um, he may pop in with some questions. So um, we appreciate the opportunity to present our plan tonight. Um, I do think uh, I want to be brief, as Lisa mentioned, because I know the public is waiting. Um, I do believe I want to thank Corey. I think he gave a comprehensive overlook of what our plan is. So I um, just want to give a little bit of narrative about how this plan came to be. Um, and so when... Uh, we were approached about um, the seller wanting to sell the property. We were aware of what the density was. As we laid out our plan, we were looking to um, try and honor the surrounding uses. And so you will see the reason for the twin homes is because they actually have a lower height. So adjacent to the single family homes, um, you're going to see more of a continuity of um, height structure and then crossing the widened street. Um, our proposed product is um, approximately five feet under the maximum. So it's sitting at 30. Um, we did take note of all the comments that have been said. Um, we, uh, so we will make sure prior to the 27th, we address those. I just wrote some brief statements about which ones they were. We did have a licensed architect um, draw these conceptual plans and we do have them on staff. So we will make sure to stamp those. Um, we do hear um, 
we do hear the comment about the additional visitor parking. So we will rework the plan slightly um, to make sure and accommodate for that. We want to provide some on-street parking and then we will go into the green space. Um, we thought we had given the percentage that was um, required there. We probably maybe didn't note that clear enough. So we have a little bit of extra wiggle room. I also do want to mention that the reason why we did go through the PUD process, um, as uh, Corey mentioned, is because we are planning on this community for home ownership. So it's imperative for us that we can um, bring those homeowners to the site and for them to have um, that fee simple ownership. Um, we understand that traffic and circulation is a concern. We have already um, enlisted a traffic study with focus engineering. We will turn that in prior to the next meeting. They did confirm that the additional units that we are asking for are a low impact. One of the things that um, will happen with the redevelopment of this is two access points, one from the frontage road um, and the other side. Currently, because the property has not been developed, um, that's actually, to my understanding, not part of the current code to not have two access points. So um, that will um, help with some of the low traffic and we'll be bringing that in. We will more formally address the utilities and drainage um, uh, prior to the next one. We had our civil do the drainage plan and we'll make sure to put the calcs on that. Um, so uh, that's the basics of the neighborhood. Again, I, I um, understand the power of public comment, so I wanna be brief. I do wanna mention that um, we are sensitive to the plight of the mobile home residents. Um, I do want to clarify, there has been a little confusion through the news, which is that we actually don't currently own the property, um, but we did set forth a plan in good faith if this property um, does meet the uses that we are seeking, that we hope will um, increase the ability for a safe and smooth transition, um, which is at a considerable financial cost to the company. Um, th that plan would go into effect upon actual transfer of the ownership, which would not take in place until all approvals um, potentially are obtained. So I just wanted to clarify that. Um, as uh, the public and staff are aware, we did submit um, a plan as part of this and we plan to honor that, but it would not take place until we're the actual owner of the property, which is not currently the case. Thank you very much. So, I don't know if um, anybody from the Planning Commission has any other questions um, for us at this time. I'm happy to... Um, answer any questions. I have a question. Uh, you said you were wanting to, or you were gonna be able to rework the parking in the green space area. Do you feel confident that you're gonna make it to the required amount of visitor parking that was mentioned in the staff report by reworking? Because right now, um, I think it it's quite less than what it needs to be. So how do you feel like that's gonna happen? Yeah, good question. Corey, correct me if I'm wrong, but the visitor parking is half stall per unit, correct? That is correct. And so I think the concern that you are raising is actually that we are in compliance, is that the way it's positioned with the two stalls on the duplex, it's maybe not for the appropriate use that we would want it to, not that we don't actually have 40 visitor stalls, because I do think we provided those. Is that correct? Yeah, I don't, it's clear that you have the 12 additional stalls around the, uh, the uh, amenity space. It's, it's clear that you have two parking stall capacity in the twin homes. So there's a substantial amount. It's clear that there can be some on-street parking 
I do not have a count on how much in, on street parking would be existence, but I did raise in the staff report that we are 30 feet wide. If we, we need 20, I think with the fire department. And so that does leave us 10 feet, but you know, I just wanna make sure that we, we address the visitor parking because that's been one of the big design problems is that we've had some small streets, they park on the street, they block the fire apparatus. And I just want to see from my perspective to feel more comfortable, what are the counts on the on-street parking? What is the distances? And do we meet the additional that's needed? So okay. you're probably fairly, fairly close by count, I would say, but I, I couldn't confidently say that to the commission. Okay. My question, um, well, my question also is, what's the precedent for counting visitor parking in driveways? That's, I, I've not seen that as precedent in applications that we've seen before. So that's where my question to you, Darlene, was that I was just assuming it was just that, that visitor parking stalls. And so I'm interested that we're counting parking on driveways as visitor parking because I haven't seen that before. You don't okay. see that, but you see a 25 foot setback and it's only required to be 20 feet deep. So you have ability for side by side parking in for visitors at the homes, at the twin homes. Okay, so it's just, it's there's the potential there, but it's just not, um, right now it's not on the plan to have 40 and maybe with the setback changes and with some other on-street things, we could make that happen, right? Yeah, what I hear you say um, is the, what we will address moving forward. And to be honest, I don't, I don't know exactly how our plan is going to be for us to do that. I just know that prior to the 26, I believe what I hear um, the commission saying is that the spirit of it is, is that um, visitor parking is equally distributed through whatever product type. So we will be more aware of how to give more visitor parking to the actual townhomes where they have the alleys and don't have the ability. We did make the advance with widening the road to 40 feet, which I believe was only, sorry, to 30 feet. Um, and so we should have noted on our plan that we had some additional visitor parking. That was a misstep by us. But um, what I can commit to you is that the next plan you're going to see is not just adding visitor parking just on the street. So we'll have to come up with some more creative ways to add that additional parking in the spirit of um, who is going to live in the townhomes and how their family and friends can come visit them. Awesome, thank you so much, Darlene. Darlene, as a follow-up to Becky's, I would suggest that on a future plan, you make it clearly noted on that plan, maybe with a different shade of a color, where you are designating those visitor stalls. So it's easy for the commission and it's also easy for the public to see and identify those uh, elements of the project. Yeah, that's a great point. I think that we only address parking on our site plan. So probably what we'll do next time around is do a, um, a diagram specifically for parking and we can make sure that it's color coded, color coded and more clear. Thank you. Any other questions for the applicant? Oh, seeing none, thank you very much. We appreciate your comments. So- thank you. Now I'll take this opportunity to open the public hearing and invite any member of the public who wishes to speak um, to speak to this matter. So as I indicated at the outset, just by way of reminder, I have a list of participants. I don't know if the public can see this or not, but I can see the list of people based on your names that you've put in um, when you first joined the room. So, and it's all alphabetically based on your first name to give people heads up in terms of how this is gonna be coming down. So we'll start with each person. As I call your name, um, our host will unmute so that you're able to provide your comments. Again, remember, please state your name and your city of residence, your full name and your city of residence. And then um, we'd love to hear from you, uh, trying to keep in mind that we have up to five minutes per person. So we're gonna start with Angie Rennie. Go oh dear. And then on deck will be somebody that, it, I just have Becky. 
So Becky is on deck, Angie will be up, um, and we'll turn the time over to you. Oh my, uh, I am just here to observe for right now and I will send my comments in later, thank you. Fantastic. And that is a perfect way to do it. You certainly don't have to provide comments if you don't want to. I just need to make sure that every person that is participating in this Zoom meeting has the opportunity to provide a comment if they would like to do so. So if you don't want to do so, that's fine. You're perfectly willing to say, nope, um, I will pass and I'll send it to the next person. So next on my list is Becky and on deck, we have Bridget Bowers. So let's turn the time over to Becky. Are you there? Uh, I have no comment. I'm just, I'm with the clipper. Fantastic. Next up, Bridget Fowers on deck, Carol Lindsay. So we'll turn the time over to Bridget. Okay, can you guys hear me? Yes, if you'll just say your full name and, and your city of residence for us. Fantastic. Um, so my name is Bridget Bowers, and I am from Centerville. I'm actually the 645 North 400 West, just right here next to the, um, the development, the plan development. And I just wanted to kind of raise a couple of concerns as we're, we're talking about this conditional use permit. Um, I guess one of the first ones, just I thought that there were some great conversations going back and forth about the additional parking. And I, I'm glad to see that that's being con considered because there's a, a big difference between um, conceptual and actual that kind of happens with many of these streets and the parking, especially looking directly in this area. We have, um, you know, Pioneer Gardens, we have the townhomes. And if you do try and go down any of those roads with the, with the side parking and um, the individual houses there, it's very difficult to go through. And we're seeing a lot of um, semis rolling back through those townhomes, through where those families are living. And going into ACE, we're seeing a lot of really heavy traffic and cars going very quickly around those um, really narrow roads. And it, it's, a, it's a big concern by adding those additional nine to 12 units that, that, that that's just gonna add to the traffic and congestion. Um, so there's definitely something different between concept and actual there. And I would say too, with the, with the, with the visitor, visitor parking, this is one thing that kind of kept coming to my mind is we have the, the duplexes that are right there that are going to have designated visitor parking within their, within their driveways. But I, you have all of the, the condiment, or not the condiment, the townhomes that are they going to ask their, their duplex neighbors if they can have somebody come over and park there if they're having visitors? Um, are they all going to be sharing and kind of splitting those, those 12? Um, I think that that definitely needs to be taken into consideration of where that use is going to go and, and how that's actually going to play out when people are living and driving and moving around. Um, my last point that I kind of wanted to bring up too has to do with just <laughs> mitigating the impact for me and my family. Um, being directly adjacent to the duplexes, uh, that right now on the plans there is a 15 foot distance between the back of the house and my fence which means I, I, I appreciate Darlene that you were kind of talking about trying to provide some privacy and you know, make sure that you went down from the three story to the two story into this, the single families, but you guys also put balconies on that second floor and 15 feet away from my fence. Um, that's gonna be really uncomfortable if you get a neighbor that's you know, right there watching you all the time. Um, there's one thing that I do like about Centerville and where I do live is we do have a lot of trees. We have um, good space between our neighbors. And I feel like I'm gonna have somebody just being able to peer down too, actually directly into my backyard all of the time. Um, so maybe that's something to consider just as a resident and, and how that would affect those living along the Applewood Drive. Um, that's all I have to say, and I really appreciate the opportunity to talk, and I will also be submitting some additional notes that I've taken from this. So thank you for sharing and um, allowing me to speak. Thank you very much. We appreciate your comments. So next up is Carol Lindsay on deck is Casey Nielsen. So we'll turn the time over to Carol. Hi, this is Carol. I'm 661 Applewood, so I'm right behind the parking or the proposal too. But I've already sent in my comments, so I don't really have anything I have to say. Great. Thank you so much. Thanks. Next up is Casey Nielsen on deck is Centerville residence. So 
Casey. Thank you so much. Yep. Uh, if you'll just remember to say your full name and where you live. My name is Casey Nielsen. I'm here in Centerville. I'm actually resident number five, and I've lived here for six years in the mobile park. Um, in 2013, I returned from my LDS mission and spent a year and a half gutting and rebuilding my home at the park. And my parents used retirement funds to help me put new floors, walls, ceilings, and a roof on my home. And it took hundreds of hours mudding, sanding, and painting. Uh, the total renovations to my home were $10,000. Um, I had no intention of moving or selling my home, and I've invested heavily into it. Last autumn, I spent $500 repairing my roof from damages from the east winds we experienced. Um, I've la happily lived here in Centerville, grateful for my home that I can afford. Um, but in, 20, uh, in July 2019, my rent was raised an additional $300. Um, and I was notified by a note that was left on my door um, by Roland Harrison. Um, at the end of the letter, it said, we hope that you will remain in the park for many years to come. And we're kind of in the situation where we're receiving news of a change of use. Uh, my home was built in 1973 and it can't be removed from the park. Um, there, there was an offer of $2,000 if I leave by October, and that value, that, that amount is not the value of my home, nor would it cover the moving expenses to a new home or to rent an apartment that requires first and last month's rent, security deposits, pet deposits, etc. However, that amount would cover nearly four months of the lot fee on which my home sits now. Um, I live here because it's what I can afford. I know that we're facing this COVID-19 pandemic. Um, and there are a lot in the park, including myself, who have been uh, uh, furloughed and have experienced job losses and financial difficulties, exp uh, expensive repairs um, and, and investments to their homes. And I'm not only just concerned for myself on what I'm going to do, but I'm also concerned about my elderly neighbors who can't really afford anywhere else um, to accommodate their needs. Um, I know that the city council has a lot uh, to make a decision on. Um, and this is kind of a desperate time for us. So thank you so much for listening to us and for your time. Thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, next up is Center This is kind of a desperate time for us. So thank you so much for listening to us and for your time. Okay, so we have Centerville residents next. Next up is Centerville residents. Somebody does not have their YouTube. YouTube. Okay. It's the YouTube. Yeah, can you, the Centerville residents, will you guys mute your YouTube? Ah, that did it. Thanks. Sorry. Nope. Sorry, there we go. Can you hear me? Yes, yeah, sorry. This okay. is a learning process for everyone. So. I am Lindsay Duncan. I know that you've heard a lot from me and a lot about me, but I'd like to share a little bit of my story. Um, I moved here to Centerville eight years ago, and I grew up actually on the frontage road. Um, and my family has lived here for 27 years. Um, I was married to a man in the military for 10 years. And when we divorced, I had to move back home to somewhere I could afford and we've made this house our home you know we bought it and we gutted the whole thing and put 10 you know ten thousand dollars into fixing it up and making it our home um my kids have made their rooms their own they've been able to paint their walls the colors that they want sorry I have a yard where my dogs can go out and play and my kids my kids will be going to school next year and my son will be a senior at Viemont and to tear them out of school in the middle of the school year just breaks my heart to leave my family to leave my friends um, for them to leave our family and their friends as well you know it's been hard for all of us our homes are worth so much more than $2,000 and there's so many people here that won't have anywhere to go. Sorry, be patient with us because we actually have more residents here that want to speak. Um, I'm just wondering if CW Land has all of this land that they can build on, um, why they chose here, why they chose to come and take all of our homes and bulldoze them down or, <laughs> I don't understand, I guess, as a person, as a human being. So 
that's all I have to say right now. But um, I have some elder, elderly residents that will be coming up and speaking to you. So just be patient as they make it up to the computer, okay? Okay. Hi, if you could Hi. just say your name and tell us your city of residence, please. Okay. My name is Debbie Cabasis, and I am a resident of Centerville, Utah. I've been a resident for 29 years. I've lived in this home mobile home park for 29 years. Um, I've actually lived in my first mobile home down the street and then I moved up to this four bedroom mobile home which was same size as a home and when I moved into it I was a single mom but my son was five. You know the comment this that um, Mrs. Wilcox said about the the toy and the thing's spinning. And um, I just wanna say that the news that we got, we were already spinning with this COVID-19 and having to deal with having to stay home. And, and then we got the, the letter, we're spinning so fast that we're about to fall off. I just, I've invested so much in my home. I've, I've remodeled it and I've done so much to it. And, and I know that they don't have the responsibility to to pay us anything, but $2,000 is just like a slap in the face. I'm, I'm close to 10 years to my retirement and I have to start all over because this is all I've invested in. This is my home. This is where my son grew up. I have memories here. We have a community. We have people that are older that I have to start over. And, and mind, Mine is older too. And um, even if I could move it, I have to come down in price to have it moved. I don't know if I could move it, but the timing, the time we have during this COVID-19, we've lost a couple of months because we weren't able to really do much. And then to have the four months that they're telling us is not enough time to even consider to see if we can even do anything, you know? And then I just want you to know that when you're making your decision, we are residents of Centerville. I shop at all the stores. My kids went to the schools. You know, I participate in all the activities. I go to the park on the fourth of July, the third of July. I do everything. I am a resident of Centerville, and ninety percent of the people here will not be able to be a resident anymore because of the the housing is so high for most of them. And so, when you make your decision, I want you to see that the impact that you are doing on people. I know that this is a privately owned resident that is selling the land but there but I just know that this is impacting our lives that's all I have to say for now thank you for listening and I think there's more to be said so thank you thank you Hi, if you could just state your name for us and your city of residence before you get started, please. 
Um, I'm Carolyn Eccles. I sent in the packet maybe a little too early, but I do have a little continuance on that packet. Um, I have a 1973 trailer and it had a problem with the roof and the Davis County helped me get a roof and fix it up and fix the inside to the front room and the, they call it the front room and, and the kitchen and also got a new porch. My, my home looks really comfortable. I added um, a lot of things inside the house and I didn't think I would have to move because I'm 88 years old and I felt like I wouldn't be, I didn't, didn't think I'd have to move. And we, in the park, really don't have no place to go. We can't move our trailers. We're sort of stuck. And I appreciate you listening to me. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, hi, I'm Jennifer. I live in number 15 in this development that you talked about parking spots and things where. Jennifer, can you state your last name for us before it's you Jennifer, go? Jennifer Pace. Thank you so much. Number 15. Um, I haven't even been here a year. Um, I depleted my savings. My parents helped with their retirement to make our house a home. Um, I don't have two incomes, I have one. And um, the school system here is, I've been here my whole life, my parents, my grandparents, my great grandparents. I love Centerville. And um, it's just, my story is a lot like the, the first resident who went, um, we renovated everything. Um, yard sprinklers, everything. And we got the notice that said that we were going to be here for many years to come. So it kind of made us think that our investment was going to be worth it. So imagine telling my kids that we have to move. Um, uh, we, I think we put about, about $15,000 into renovations. And having to walk away from all that is heartbreaking. Um, um, no, my parents live actually across the street. Um, my kids go to school here, everything's here. I don't know where I'm gonna go. I don't know what I can afford being as though my savings is gone. So anyway, that's all I wanted to say. Thank you. Thank you very much. I am Brad Bangetter. I live in the trailer 33. Um, I'm on fully security disability my mom's lived here since 1984. I came up here to help out with her at her house. And she's also now retired. She's lived here 40 something years. Her name's Cheryl Bangetter. My brother's a city councilman at Sunset. And you know, me and my mom's looked for homes in our price range, anything that we could rent that would suit us and work out for both of us. And I just can't find nothing. And there's a lot of other people that can't do the same either. 
thank you very much. Thank you for your comments. My name is uh, Becky Herden. <clears throat> I live in number 32, but I would mostly like to address my mother, who is probably the second longest person that has lived in this uh, mobile home park. She's lived here for 40 years. Uh, she's 73 years old. She has struggled our whole lives to raise three kids with no welfare, no help. And it will be my sole responsibility to find some place for her, myself, my husband, and my daughter that is autistic that cannot live by herself. Um, I just think that you guys need to consider that you're displacing people that have worked their whole lives to have some place for their kids and it it just angers me so much that my mom has worked so hard and she worked at a job for 34 years that she absolutely hated and they just they did away with her job to move it to china and she, like i said she has struggled all these years to take care of three kids all by herself and i honestly do do not know what i'm going to do how how am i going to find some place that i can take care of her she she's my sole responsibility and I, I just don't understand why this company and Centerville City is just allowing allowing this to happen I mean I <clears throat> you you I I feel I don't <clears throat> I don't understand everything I'm I'm not exactly sm uh, smart as far as legal goes but I just don't understand how any of you in your hearts can, uh, yeah, yeah you, you may have to approve this, but these people that want to buy this, they ought to be responsible for making sure that when we have to leave here that we're given a fair, especially these people in back of me that owe so much more money and have gutted their houses. And I just don't understand how, how any of you and this company can just throw all these people out. Um, I know what Centerville City, I know they've always wanted to get rid of this part, but it's this is not fair. It's not fair. There's so many people down here that that are not trailer trash that have worked to have this, their homes. And I don't know, I, I don't know what else to say. I just feel like that if you guys have any kind of heart, any kind of conscience that you will at least make this company responsible to pay to help these people out. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Hi, uh, my name is Brandy Broadback Dudley. I have lived in this neighborhood since uh, 1980 when I was two years old. I grew up here. Wonderful community. We all knew each other. We all watch each other's backs. We all take care of each other. Sorry, last year, March 30th, I lost my husband and I was grateful that I had a home that I owned to help take care of my special needs daughter in a way that I could afford. Uh, we, we've made many upgrades to our home throughout the, 
the almost 16 years that we've been here, we've put thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars into our home and they want us to walk away from it, which is so hard. I need to be able to have a place for my, my daughter that she can be comfortable, that she can keep her pets and not continue to lose out. I also am very concerned about the future of Centerville. We are talking, if they bring all these units in, we have an additional 150 vehicles on the road, potentially. So that is going to impact this area because right now here, we don't have that many vehicles. There's a lot of people that do not drive. So with Dairy Queen, with the trucks, with everything else, that is going to impact this area significantly. Also, I, you know, there is just so much that needs to be looked at. Um, and I hope that the right decision can be made for all of us. So thank you. Thank you very much. My name is Prudy Scheib and I've lived here for 32 years. I'm 88 years old. I'm a widow and it's sure kind of hard to try to start over again at this age. And thank you for listening. Thank you. My name's Vicki Pace Mulvey and my mother originally moved here in the 80s. And then when I found myself homeless with three children, she turned her trailer over to me. I raised my kids here and I've been here for 18 years. I lost my job in August. I have a medical condition. And the only thing I own is that trailer. And I have no idea what's going to happen to me. I'm devastated and I'm lost and I can barely make it through a day. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good evening, my name is Christopher Height. I'm a resident of Centerville Mobile States. I live in trailer number nine, been there for this year, well, starting next year on the 4th, the day that we're supposed to be out would be my 21st, turn of the 21st year here. Um, I currently am 100% disabled, federal uh, disability I got, you know, which is less than 1200 a month and there's no places out there that start around maybe nine and go up to 13, 14, 1500 dollars. I don't make that a month, I can't do it. Uh, simple fact is, is there's a lot of good people here in this park. We've been trying our best to, to trying our best and holding our breath, really, to see what goes on with this. Uh, I've raised a son here. He's going 14 next month. I'm going 55 next month. Um, it's just as difficult as it is to live here. It's all we have. And there's no place else to go because I've checked. There's nothing out there as far as rentals. You can buy all day, but you can't afford it. You can't afford it. So just choose wisely when your decision making comes up. There's 45 families and probably 150, 200 people that you're displacing. Um, God forbid it turned around and you were on the receiving end of this instead of us. Maybe you'd think differently. Appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Hi, my name's Tina McLeod. I've lived here for 20 years. Um, I have worked my butt off for 20 years, worked in two jobs. And then three years ago, I had a medical condition that kicked my butt and I had to use a lot of my savings. In the meantime, I can't work two jobs. So, and in the meantime, I had to totally get my house and redo it totally inside. So I spent $5,000. In the meantime, I contacted Roland Harrison and said, hey, 
do we have future here or am I wasting my time? He guaranteed me that nothing was gonna happen to the place. So I went ahead and done it. So, but in the meantime, he hasn't been the best management either. So that's a lot of our problem. We've pretty much had to depend on ourselves on taking care of situations because when he has a problem, he just ducks. He doesn't help us at all. So, you know, we pay our own property tax every year. So it's not like we just live here for whatever. But the hard part is, is we kind of feel like we're getting looked at as like we're low second class citizens where we can't afford a $500,000, $200,000 house. We can't afford twelve, thirteen hundred dollars $1,300 payments. Because I mean, I make a decent wage, but I still have car payments, insurance, all the necessities that has to keep me going. And I do it by myself where other people in here do it just as much as everybody else. We fight together and we're gonna win this battle, hopefully. But that's all we can say is try to keep positive thoughts and I don't know. It, like I said, I wish somebody, if they want to redevelop it, they're more than willing to come in and help us and make, you know, I'd pay more lot rent if they like would come in and help like put new roads in, driveways, stuff, keep the park better. But, you know, but to just kick us out and make us start over, I'm sorry, our homes are our homes and there's no dollar amount on them. So thank you for your time. I appreciate your consideration. Thank you for your comment. Okay, so my name is Shelly Pace. I am with the Davis Community Housing Authority. And I just wanted to speak to a few different things. First off, as Caroline stated, we have helped with um, using CDBG federal funding to actually improve some of these um, homes. And so I think that should be considered where it hasn't been that long since we've come, come in and actually used federal funds, as well as I think that it's, like the points that have been brought up on traffic is significant. Like I've been to a lot of different apartment complexes and high density residential where having street parking does not mitigate the issue because a lot of, sit of the residents have more than two cars. So anyone with a teenager is going to be using up those visitor parking spots. So at that point, and with it being on the street, that does not mean that it will only be those residents using the parking. So I think that is something that needs to be thoroughly thought out as well as 40% green space. I don't see a way for them to establish that amount of green space while taking in, into consideration the amount of parking spots they need with how dense they want this to be. So I think the key thing here is if they do, are not granted the 12 units, then that saves this park essentially. And while this does, like I understand that it needs to be based on more than just the resident stories, like ultimately you are affecting people's lives here. And Centerville needs like actually housing that people can afford. And at this point you would be removing so many of the locations that people can actually afford in this area. And so with that, I will close our line. Thank you, I appreciate yours and everyone's comments. Thank you. Okay, um, next up we have Chelsea Christensen and then on deck is David Miller. And Chelsea, if you could mute your YouTube, if you have that in the background. I don't. Okay, great. I think you're ready. Or hmm, she just went mute again. No, Chelsea, do you have any comments or do you want me to move to the next person? I do not have a comment. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much. Next up is David Miller. On deck is Donald World. Ward Oldman. Hello. Hello. If you'll just state your name and your city uh, of residence. David Miller. I live in Centerville. I'm on the north side of Applewood Drive. Just a couple of brief comments. You know, regarding traffic, I, I think somebody mentioned they had done a traffic study. 
first of all, any traffic study that's been done during this COVID situation is totally invalid. You can't, you can't go with what's happening you know, since then, you've got to take into account the way it was or, you know, what it will be. You can't do a study now or in the near future and have it be valid. And in regards to um, the design, I, I just re reiterate what um, uh, Bridget said. You know, I, I can't believe that they have those. They seem proud that they only had 25 foot high duplexes, but that whole north, north row of duplexes, all those second story units look into the back yards of everyone along the south side of Applewood Drive. And then um, also, I just wanted to touch on one thing with the, a question really. You know, you talk about the conditional use moving from eight to 12 per acre. Uh, what exactly is the conditions? I don't really understand what the conditions they have to meet. And along those lines, you know, as, as a developer, you know, they go down along the list, check this, check this, check this. We've met all the conditions, but that doesn't mean, you know, they've done what's best for the neighborhood, what they've done for the neighbors, what they've done. It's just, you know, a checklist of things that say, oh, we met everything, we're good. And that's basically all I have to say at this point. I haven't you know, had a lot of time to review the material I plan to in more detail, but thank you. Thank you. And we'll make notes of the questions that you had asked and have staff address that at our upcoming meeting. So we appreciate your comments. Okay, next up is Donald Wardleman, sorry, I'm probably slaughtering your last name. On deck is Dorian Olson. Mr. Wolderman, are you there? And would you like to speak? It shows that you are talking, but I can't hear you. Um, so let's go ahead and we will come back to you. And let's move to Dorian Olson. On deck is Francisca Block. Hi, my name's Dorian Olson. I'm a resident of Centerville here. I live in Mobile Park number 24. I, uh, I've been here 23 years. Moved into the uh, Mobile Park here as a investment. Um, my wife and I were newly wed then and uh, we're hoping to build equity so that we could get ourselves into a home, something that had land and everything. That was our goal. Um, of course, everything happens and stuff. I have medical, my family now has medical. And uh, so we've kind of been a little bit stuck here and uh, we've invested in the home. Uh, the big storm of, uh, 2005, 2004, somewhere in there, um, put some damage into our home. And so we were able to do a lot of remodel. Um, the roof has a lifetime warranty on it, as long as we live here. And that's worth thousands and thousands of dollars. Um, we just enclosed a porch that made it so that we had more storage space so that we could keep everything for our our family and uh, that three thousand four thousand dollar enclosure is now nothing it's gone so this is the things that we have to deal with here because of the developer uh, that's all i've got for now thank you i appreciate your comments um next up is Dorian Olson on deck is Francisca Blanc. Wait, we just did Dorian, sorry. Next up is Francisca Blanc on deck is Grace Olson. So Francisca. Oh, it looks like. 
This one coming through looks like it's Donald Wardleman. Nope. Sorry, pause with us while we have some technical difficulties. Here we go. Okay, Francisca Block. If you'll, I know I'm saying names, but that might not be the correct name. So if you'll just that's say okay. the full name. No, in city of that's Rosa. okay. You, you said it quite right. So my name is uh, Francisca Blanc. I'm in the advocacy and outreach coordinator with Utah Housing Coalition. And the reason I'm part of this meeting is because residents from Centerville Mobile Home Estates have reached out to us about a month ago. And um, the Utah Housing Coalition is a statewide membership-based organization. And we promote and um, do advocacy in support of affordable housing across the state. I personally, I specialize in manufactured housing issues um, because just the way my career went. So I got to learn quite a bit of the, you know, manufactured housing laws in the state of Utah, federal laws, and, and you know, the intricacies of, of all of it. So uh, regarding this, um, you know, conditional permit, I would like to say that uh, we look at this as a tremendous loss of affordable housing in Centerville. Centerville at this point does not have any affordable housing in the city. And um, we are well aware of, you know, kind of the conditions of the park and the ownership of the park. So, um, and we're also aware that the, um, the new development that was presented today uh, can be beneficial to the city, but after all, uh, we have to realize those are people who live in an affordable housing community. And um, we are very worried about their situation. And we are also concerned about the fact that the city doesn't have any affordable housing in place. So that was my position as from Utah Housing Coalition. I would also like to express my position as a citizen advocate because my parents are manufacturer homeowners in Solid Lake County in Tellersville. It's a senior um, uh, manufacturer home community. So this issue is uh, very hard for me. Um, the condition of the park, I have to place it completely on the family responsibility because they have not been taking care of the park for so long. Uh, the residents are caught in this kind of cell mix. Nobody really knows at this point who has the right to sell the park or not. The residents are concerned. Um, I'm concerned because they're gonna lose their housing. And no matter how the house look, that, that house is a, is a home, is a temple for him like it is for all of us. And um, after all, we are facing an eviction during a pandemic. We cannot forget that. And I would like the planning commission members to really take in consideration the human factor of all of it. I am so proud of the, all of the residents who spoke up. Please remember that I am an advocate I'm a resident organizer. I spoke with most of the residents in the park and I know most of their stories. Um, they have to lose quite a bit. And um, losing this land will be a tremendous loss to Centerville City because it is affordable housing. And I would like to thank you so much for giving me this time. Thank you. And I will unmute myself now. Thank you very much for your comments. Okay, next up is Grace Olson, and then we will circle back to Donald Wardleman and see if um, we've resolved the technical issues there. So, Grace. Perfect, and you are muted. So if you will, Leah, can you unmute her? Perfect. Okay, I should be unmuted. Thank you. I am Grace Olson, and I am a resident of Centerville Mobile Estates. I live in number 24. You heard my husband, Dorian, just a few moments ago. Um, like you said, we've been here for 23 years and, and this really is our home. When we first moved here, Vestal Harrison, mm -hmm. who is very well known mm -hmm. in, um, excuse me, I've got, sorry, Vestal Harrison, who is very well known um, throughout the city, he owned this mobile home park and 
when we came in, we had to actually go through an application process and interview process. And, um, you know, he was a really, a, a really wonderful man and he really managed it and he cared about the people here. And so we purchased our little home and we raised our children here and we were the, we were kind of the, the um, neighborhood, uh, house in the neighborhood where everybody came to play. We had a swing set and a sandbox and we had the trampoline. And so I was kind of the mom to the, to all the little kids. And, and um, you know, our kids were both involved in the scouting program. And, and so was my husband and myself. We devoted for just hours and hours and, and years helping helping other people's kids become good scouts and, and teaching service. And our family provided service to the community. Um, so, you know, we're both very hard essential workers. I work for the Davis County School District and I'm in special education. And my husband, he works um, a couple of jobs to try and, um, you know, make our home, make our little little home, our sweet little home. We've, we have just so much medical that, you know, we've had to have these multiple jobs to, to meet our medical needs. Um, uh, you know, when Vestal passed away in 2001, his, his children inherited his property. And, and for several years, they did a pretty good job of managing it. But, you know, the last eight years or so, it, that has not been the case. And when we've had um, situations, we've not been able to contact him and uh, get anyone to come help. And of course, the city wasn't able to because it was private property. So individual homeowners, you know, we did the best we could with the means we had at hand. And um, so when people, if they could drive by and we've heard people make, you know, some comments that, well, it's kind of a nice or it would be important to keep in mind that, you know, there is only so much people who have no money can do in something of this nature. But as mentioned before, at the end of July last year, we did receive a letter from Ruin Harrison. And when he more than doubled our lot fee, he um, indicated that he hoped we would be here for many years to come. And many of us did take that as fact. We, we trusted that as fact. And had we known that eight months later we were going to be evicted, we would not have put money into these homes. So um, that's been very uh, troublesome. We've researched and we found out that um, homes that are pre-HUD cannot be moved. So if they're like older than 1977, they, they aren't gonna be able to be moved. Um, and then for homes that can be moved, it costs upwards of $15,000 to move them. Um, and most residents here wouldn't, would not have $15,000 to move them. And the $2,000 being offered as compensation doesn't even begin to scratch that cost. And you run into also, there are not that many available lot spaces in Davis County to move a mobile home. They, they just don't have them. And you would have to meet municipality codes for those too. It's just very cost prohibitive. So, um, you know, a lot of these homes are worth, if you could sell them on the open market, you could get 30, 40 double wides, maybe 70, $80,000. And if they could be sold, then people would have money to start over. But they're not going to be able to be sold because nobody's going to buy them because they're not going to be a mobile home park. And so essentially, everybody's being asked to walk away from all that money. And they have to start with nothing. You know, I'm 60 years old. I was recently diagnosed with breast cancer. And I don't know how I'm gonna start over. And I'm, I understand that, you know, we, we need to be fair for everybody. But I think when we are talking about being fair for everybody, we have to be fair to us too to expect us all to go out, people who have $800 a month, and that is their full income, they will not find a home in city. 
We are essential workers for you. We have paid our property taxes. We have served you. We are residents. And we're not just being evicted from our homes. We are essentially being evicted from our city. And our children are being evicted from their schools. And Ms. Olson, I appreciate your comments, but we're you. you're coming up on your five minute limit and I thank want to be respectful you. for others. So I appreciate well, it. If you you're listening to me. Of course. And if you have additional comments, you're welcome to submit those um, I will. Thank you. at the next hearing. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we are going to circle back now to Donald Wardleman. And on deck is Heidi Chagrud. Mr. Right. Perfect. Yeah, okay. If you'll just you turn now. Yes, we can hear you. So if you can state I'm your name. Not, and your city I'm of not residence. Don Wardleman, but I'm Don Wardleman's son on behalf of him. And he's, he's like an older gentleman. And he's afraid he's going to cry and stuff when he talks about it. So he asked me to talk for him, and I'll probably cry for him. Will you state your name and city of residence, please? Uh, my name is Brian Wortelman. I am Donald Wortelman's son, which I think you were trying to talk to Donald. And he's standing here with me, but he's, he's afraid to talk. He's lived in the trailer park for 22 years now, and I've stayed there off and on. It's been really, really a great deal for him and he's just having a hard time with uh with it going away i mean it's affordable a lot of nice neighbors nice neighborhood it just seems a little hard to deal with i'll be short but that the whole thing just going to something that most people that live there now can't quite afford to move to the new place so yeah it really needs to be a little more warning or maybe keep it for a while that's that's about it. But it's been a good uh, trailer park, good community, and I uh, hate to see what's happening. That's about it. Thank you. We appreciate your comments. Uh, next up, Heidi Chagrud, and on deck is Holly Hahn. Hello, my name is Heidi Chagrud, and I'm a Centerville resident, and I. Um, would just Mike, I had a comment very similar to Dave Miller's regarding the traffic study and when the date that it was done and its validity if it was in fact during during this COVID-19 um, time frame. I'm curious, um, speaking of traffic studies, I'm curious regarding the new curb cut that will be on the frontage road. And I believe it needs to match the curb cut at the McDonald's unless the traffic study suggests to offset that curb cut um based on the curvy nature of the frontage road there um something that i would hope you would consider is typically you step up densities as you work away from a commerce area and i don't think increasing the density to the 9 to 12 units is as compatible as is, is as if you kept it at the eight the highest end of the eight i think that where you have the single family neighborhood right up against the um, nine to 12 units, it's a little incompatible. Um, if you do something to consider, if you do allow the higher density, you may want to consider requiring a larger landscape buffer between the two densities um, to mitigate the higher density um, if you do allow it. Um, I would ask that you potentially consider treating the one road that goes through this development more like a street and not like an alley and give it a sidewalk on both sides of the street with a park strip. So um, that it adds to the, the look and the feel of this. You're essentially creating a little neighborhood in this development. And I think that it's more valuable to have those street trees in that streetscape. And it provides the ability for the residents within that little neighborhood, a more walkable friendly environment also park strips and park strip trees tend to give um, a, an actual physical space for the vehicles and an actual physical space for the residents. And so those um, those are more compatible that way. Um, I do have a question that is potentially for the developer. I am wondering what his plan or the developer's plan is to install the vinyl fences in the backyards of all the residences 
that um, are adjacent to this new development. Everyone adjacent to the development, as I can tell now, has a fence. And so would he be installing a new fence adjacent to it? Would he be taking down the old fences? Just wondering how he's gonna work and if he'd be willing to work with the neighbors on that matter. Something else that I think uh, I would like you to consider is the, pro the, the private and public spaces are not clearly defined within this development. And I think the development would be enhanced by creating a graduation of outdoor spaces that allows um, for clearly defined what is public and what is private. Um, something else I would like you to consider is when this development comes in to potentially enhance the sidewalk and add a park strip along the frontage road. And then ho hopefully that park, that sidewalk on the frontage road could then go and connect to the trail sidewalk that is in place already on the north side of the Chick-fil-A. That little trail connector is kind of isolated from the rest of our trail system. And it would be great if that could connect through the development of this um, along the frontage road. Um, I would also like to make note that I think that oftentimes open space and landscape areas are the first thing to cut when you look for more additional visitor parking. But I would, can, I would, I would say that open space is very important in places where you have higher density. And so if, if we need to have more visitor parking, then potentially we need to have fewer units so that we can maintain that open space. Um, another thought that I had was it would be really great if those pickleball courts or their open neighborhood park could be used by the public and not just the uh, people that live within this development. I think Centerville's kind of shy on open space per resident. And so it'd be great if we could have open space for all residents to use. Um, I second the comment from Bridget about second story balconies looking back into the residents um, on the north side. And I just want you to remember that the goal that Corey presented in the beginning of the zoning description is to permit a well-designed development. And so I think there's a couple tweaks that you guys could ask the developer um, to do that would make this a well-designed development. And that's the end of my comments, thank you. Thank you very much. And we've made note with regard to your questions on the parking study and the curb cut. And as I said at the beginning of this, we're taking down um, questions and we'll make sure to address those uh, at, during our next meeting. Okay, so up next is Holly Hahn. On deck is Ing Richens. Okay, hold on. We're just... Holly, yes, there you are. Yes. You can see us. You, absolutely, you can. If you could just both state your names for us and tell us where you live. Okay, I'm going to start with my husband first. Hi there. My name is David Hahn, and we live in the Centerville Mobile Home Estate. We are uh, trailer number or mobile home 30. And uh, I've lived in this mobile home park for 30 years. I'm 34 years old. I moved in this park when I was three or four years old. I moved in here with my father and my sister. Sorry, guys. There's memories that I made here as a kid, as a grown up, and as, as my own family. I have three beautiful children that are currently enrolled in the Davis School District. Me and my wife, we take the school, our schooling, or we take it very serious. We really want the best for our kids. And we found that Davis School District and Centerville Schools in general are where it is. We both are our Viewmont High School graduates. Again, our life is here. We've made it here. We've made it for our kids.
I just want to ask you guys to, to please take this in count of all our all of our lives that are going to be changed if it if this do if this does happen and how much it affects the families and and myself and my family too um also a more important note i want to reiterate on the traffic volume i know we've already touched bases on it but i really feel that it is very very crucial that you guys do thoroughly look into that traffic flow um currently right now 400 west has bike lanes it's biker friendly i'm a huge huge biker advocate i i love to ride my bike i love i support the biking community there's for a long time that's how me and my father got around was bikes and unfortunately at that time Centerville didn't have bike paths or bike. And now Centerville has made that accommodation for those that do ride their bikes. Four hundred West is really currently right now is not meant for a high flow of traffic. Um, just north of the art museum or the um, there, there's a crosswalk um, just past that. Um, the road, it seems to be getting narrower um, after that. Um, I, tr I repeatedly make left-hand turns into the Centerville Park to come home for work and the flow of traffic, obviously everybody's coming home between three and five to six and everybody takes that direct path and trying to make a left-hand turn without being rear-ended due to parking on the right of 400 West because of the residents that live in Pine, Pine View, or excuse me, Pioneer. It's, it's very, very scary. I mean, it, it, they literally had stopped traffic just to make a left-hand turn. And um, with that being said, I just wish we, we could really, really get a confident and for sure analysis of the uh, traffic flow for our for Centerville, especially on 400 West. And with that being said, again, reiterating that I, I lived here for 30, 30 years and um, grown up here, made good, um, good memories and can hope to continue to make good memories and, and continue to serve the Centerville City as a, um, as a, as a member of the community. Um, we look forward to the 4th of July parade. We look forward to the, uh, the carnival. We look forward to the Easter egg hunts. We look forward to all those beautiful and wonderful things that you guys put on for our citizens. I have a few minutes, so I'm gonna let my wife speak. Hi, I'm Holly Hahn and I also live in Trailer 30. Um, I actually didn't know what a trailer was before I met my husband. I grew up just down the street in Bountiful on 200 West. And I have now, we've been happily married and we actually lived, I've lived here for about 13 years. And I've loved, I've loved to grow, I, lo I love Centerville. And I love that it had the farm vibe to it. I love the Davis School District. We all know it's the best. Um, my sister who lives in Oregon is always like, you need to stay there. I wish that it could be more affordable. Um, they need to have more you know, low, low house income. And what me and my husband have been searching for is somewhere we can live around here. Yes, we did find something that fits, fits what we can afford, but the problem is they're not animal friendly. And I, I emphasize that there needs to be more animal friendly too. Um, and also along with traffic, I know we've gone over that, but it's 
we love going on bike rides, but there's so many times that we've always been, you know, almost been hit on the side of the road, just riding our bikes along with our kids. Then we have to get up on the sidewalks and I feel bad because you're people jogging. Um, we really need to make sure that you guys can find a way about with parking. Um, also, again, with like my husband was saying about school, our kids, my 12 year old, ever since he's five, he, I don't know where he got it, but he's always been wanting to go to Harvard. And he's, he has plans here in Centerville. He doesn't want to leave. He's already enrolled in classes to go to Centerville Junior High and take honor classes. And moving somewhere else is just going to throw us off. I know other places have honor classes, but the problem is, is they're already enrolling kids of where they need to be. And he'll be thrown out where he doesn't get to take those classes. And that really upsets me. And I feel bad for my neighbors, you know, they have nowhere to go. This place was a beautiful place from what my husband said. It could have been so much better with brand new trailers uh, put in here. A lot of the new manufactured homes that you do see, you know, do represent looking like the newer homes and they actually blend in. But sadly, the owners were just really, you know, bad at what they were doing and not keeping up with the park and actually running it as a business. Um, and it just makes me sad that we have to, we're not only being kicked out of our homes, but now we have to be kicked out of Centerville altogether. Me and my husband could afford around 1200 or even 13, but the problem is there's nowhere that's dog friendly. And we can't give up our dog. We've had her for six years. She's a border collie. She's very extremely smart. She learns new tricks as fast as she can. And I'm pretty sure you guys are animal lovers too. And that's just something I wish, you know, Centerville can look upon is bringing down where people can afford around a thousand dollars. You know, we do pay taxes as much as everybody else, but sadly the taxes didn't bring new roads for us and new piping for our children and, you know, the sewer systems to work properly in this, in this park. And I'm just hoping that you guys can really reach out and really help those that really need it. Um, that's all I have to say, and I thank you so much for listening to our family. Thank you. Thank you. We appreciate your comments. Um, next up, Ing Richens on deck is Jerry Hatch. Let's see. Am I? There we go. Ing Richens. There you go. There we go. If you'll just state your name and your city of residence for us before you get started. Okay, I'm Inga Richens and I live in the trailer park number 12. And um, I just kind of like to give you a little history of this trailer park. We lived here for 20 years. My husband and I um, uh, met 22 years ago and then um, got married 20 years ago and moved into the trailer. We made it a home ever since. So when we moved in, first of all, we were trying to downsize our households into one at the trailer we are living in right now. We put new siding on the trailer, central air, two new tough sheds, fenced in yard for our dog so they had a safe place to roam. We created a new life and memories in our single white trailer. My husband is retired, he's 78 years old, and still to this day works on weekends as a security guard to make ends meet. I have been on disability to my many autoimmune diseases. I am on long-term chemo infusion to prolong the damage the disease will cause. I work part-time as an in-home caregiver, but my hours have been temporarily cut due to the coronavirus epidemic. Our income has been limited because of it. We both plan to stay here until the end of our lives. <clears throat> we got our eviction letters in March and our lives have been shattered ever since. We owe $9,000 still on our trailer <clears throat> to the mortgage company that we have to pay, plus for rent at a market value. We can't afford that. Um, 
let's see, plus the cost of destroying our trailer would be approximately $7,500 for a single white trailer. This alone is a loss of 16,500. So 16,500 and we are offered $2,000 if we are out by October 15th. Our trailer is worth between 15 to $17,000. How is it possible to think 2,000 is a fair amount to destroy our homes? This is devastating news to say the least. And that will be all. Thank you, we appreciate your comments. And next up, Jerry Hatch on deck, Jonathan Blasinko. Okay, uh, my name is Jerry Hatch. Apparently I can't get my video to work because it's stopped on your end, but, uh, um, oh, here we go, now I can do it. Uh, there I am, okay. Uh, like I said, my name is Jerry Hatch. I'm a resident of the mobile home park. Uh, I live in trailer number 17. I'm 65, um, divorced, and I live on a fixed income of social security. I grew up in Utah and raised all my children here. Uh, five years ago, I moved to Oregon to help my sister after her husband died. Uh, I returned to Utah three years ago, searching for a place to live and found this affordable mobile home park. I was lucky to find a trailer available in the park. I bought it from the owner, an older gentleman who was too sick to live on his own anymore. I promised to clean it out for him and deliver all his personal effects to him, which I did. I then spent four months and thousands and thousands of dollars repairing the floors, the ceilings, a new roof, and then repainting, recarpeting, and refur refurbishing it. I was very happy that I finally had found a place of my own. I continued fixing up the place inside and outside and cleaning up the yard, et cetera. I made friends in the park and in the community. I finally had a place to call my own, a place where I could welcome family and friends and life was good. Then suddenly, Right in the midst of the worst part of the pandemic, I received an eviction notice to vacate in nine months. My life turned literally upside down and very dark. I had spent close to $10,000 to fix up this mobile home and make it a good home for me. Now, because of the age of the home being a pre-1976 HUD standard home, I can't move it to another park. I can't sell it because it can't be moved without a very costly upgrades. I have no other choice than to walk away from the home that I spent months to fix up and exhausted most of my savings. And the prospect of finding another place that I can afford and that is as nice of a home that I spent so much time and money to fix up is very dismal. So I'm stuck between a rock and a hard place. Now, I don't have the funds to buy another home as I spent most of my savings buying and fixing up this home with the intention of living here for many, many years. Now, I don't know what to do. If this park is shut down, I will lose all of my investment in this little home of mine and I feel utterly lost. That's all I can say. Thank you for listening. Thank you for your comments. Um, up next, Jonathan Lashenko uh, on deck, Kate Hosman. Okay, hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can, thank you. If you'll just state your name and your city of residence, please. Okay, my name is Jonathan Lysenko and I live in Centerville. I live on Applewood Drive and I'm trying to get the video to work, but it's, uh, it's not working. So I'll just, uh, okay, here we go. Great. Um, I've lived here for seven years. And as uh, Corey described at the beginning, the inquiry right now for the planning commission is, a, is an inquiry of whether to add the conditional use permit. 
I'd like to suggest that the Planning Commission take a step back and look a little more broadly at the situation and consider whether the mobile home park redevelopment is best uh, done with the uh, with a high uh, density 12 unit uh, uh, conditional use permit or with the existing eight, eight unit permit. Um, Applewood Drive is a uh, is, is a single family home uh, 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 area. We, we have, um, we've been around for 40 years and uh, uh, we are a, we're a community of homes. And, and uh, uh, as, as we think about the, the idea of putting a larger uh, development next to us, uh, you know, the, the question about uh, changing the use to an even higher density uh, becomes a becomes a concern. Uh, what really fits well in our community uh, would be homes like the uh, the duplexes, the the the, um, the two story duplexes that are in the uh, site plan that line the north side. If the entire uh, if the entire development were two story duplexes. Uh, that would be a natural fit, and and it would be something that fits into the into the current use. Bringing in uh, three-story townhomes uh, and packing them tightly like they are uh, brings a lot of concerns that I'll mention uh, briefly. But also, it uh, brings um, it brings a change into our community. Our community right now, uh, as I said, is is a is a community of family homes. Um, and uh, as, as we think about the, uh, you know, expanding that, uh, that, that, becomes a, um, that becomes a concern to us. Uh, let me just mention a couple of reasons why I think, uh, uh, well, a couple of concerns. Uh, first of all, the, the plan is uh, suggesting that we, we have 160 uh, uh, car, uh, parking spaces plus another 12 uh, visitor parking. Uh, currently the mobile home park has maybe 50, uh, 50 cars at, at the most. At, uh, so we're talking about potentially four times the number of cars uh, in, in, the, uh, in, uh, in, in, uh, in, in the new development. Uh, a traffic study, uh, I'm, I'm glad we're talking about that. Um, the risk of an accident on frontage road really ought to be part of that traffic study. Um, cars travel very quickly on that road. Uh, there's a lot of speeding. Uh, we ought to really look at the, uh, the accident risk. Uh, we also ought to look at the impact to the frontage road and also to um, Applewood, the secondary road. Um, as cars are, are trying to get around Parish Lane and the congestion that, that occurs on 400 West and Parish, uh, they will travel through our, our community. There's probably a dozen cars an hour that come down Applewood. <clears throat> and if we're adding another 160 cars uh, to the equation, that's only going to increase it. So the traffic study shouldn't, should address the secondary uh, roads. Uh, and of course, it, it should also address the congestion on Parish Lane and, and 400 West uh, during, uh, yeah, during as, um, as Heidi and David mentioned, during the, the, the normal uh, uh, traffic of non-COVID. Uh, we're super sensitive about parking around here because the Garden View townhomes <clears throat> are an example of a community where you really can't visit anybody there because there's no visitor parking. Uh, that's just across the street. Uh, if you try to go there, uh, you, know, you should probably, uh, the Planning Commission wants to just drive down that community. That's an example. Uh, of a community where it's impossible to park because there's just not any visitor parking. Uh, the same with Pinea townhomes, extra parking spills out onto the street. Uh, we really wanna see that uh, the parking is, is uh, appropriate. Uh, another concern is the 15 foot, uh, in the current plans, the 15 foot setback from the fence. Uh, that seems uh, too narrow. Uh, and as Dave Miller mentioned, uh, it, it provides views into the, the yards and the windows of the residents on Applewood. Um, 
the, the three-story towers that are currently on the west end of the development plan, they look out over a half a dozen homes, uh, the backyards and the side yards and the windows of a half a dozen homes. Also uh, something that uh, uh, is, is a privacy concern and, and, and should, should, be, should be considered. Uh, the, the last factor I'd like to mention is something that you know, we've, we've heard from the residents uh, at Mobile Home Park. And uh, you know, currently that really isn't on the, the table today, but I'd like, to, I'd like to ask that it be put on the table as part of a development approval. Um, just because the law does not require us to do more for the residents doesn't mean that we shouldn't. Um, our laws protect uh, birds in wetlands that can't protect themselves, but because uh, we're dealing with mobile homes and they don't own the land, the law does not protect the residents in our mobile home park. And we have a choice as a community whether to allow it. And what I would suggest is that we form a committee, uh, a committee from the community, first to meet with the residents, to allow the planners, to allow the the city to allow the developers to meet with the residents and to hear and to understand them. And second, to gather community resources, uh, to bring people in that want to assist, to publicize and advocate on their behalf, and to, uh, to show the residents of our town that we value them as much as we value the progress of our city. Thank you very much for listening to me. We appreciate your comments. Uh, next up is Kate Hosman. On deck is Mark Kernshaw. Hi, um, my name is Kate Hosman. I uh, live on 491 Applewood, so um, I'm on the north side of the, the new development. Um, I, a lot of my concerns have been addressed already, uh, and the few additional ones that I have, I will just email them in. Um, for lack of time and give other people time to, to voice their concerns. Thank you. We appreciate your comments. Next up, Mark Earnshaw on deck, Marnell Knight. Can you hear me? We sure can. If you'll state your full name and your city of residence for us, please. My full name is Mark Earnshaw. I'm here with my wife, Peggy Earnshaw. We live at 602 West Applewood Drive. We moved to Centerville in 1986. We've been a resident for 34 years. When we first moved here, this area, the trailer park was, was ran very well. Vester Harrison, it was a nice place to live. There was also a city park over there that we used to go over and play baseball. It was a great community to live in. Now we have two five-story buildings and one of them's empty. I don't, but anyway, that's all. But, the, but everything has been said tonight. Um, that I had concerns about except two things. Uh, sister Heyman, you, or Mrs. I'm sorry, I'm the bishop of this ward, so if I call you sister, I apologize. I take no offense. <laughs> <laughs> the adverse effect on the community this project has, you mentioned that the adverse effect, if I, if I interpret that right, one of the adverse effects is you're making 48 people homeless, 48 families homeless. Our Lord and Savior was on this earth today. He would be over there. He wouldn't be at my house and he wouldn't be anywhere. He would be over there. If you grant the conditional use, then the project goes through. If you don't grant it, they may back out and these people may save their homes. I'm not a lawyer. I know some of you are that are on this planning commission and I thank you for your time and your, and your efforts in, in planning for Centerville City. I know it's a great responsibility that the six of you have. I've also driven around and noticed all the other high density places that are in Centerville City, Pioneer Gardens, Pheasant Brook, the townhomes by Colonial Lumber, none of them, they all have buffers between them and the single family dwellings. 
Pinea Gardens on the east side. There's a park and there's a walkway and there's grass that's between them. None of them look down on the north side of Pinea Garden. None of those two story houses look down on Pheasant Brook. They look at a parking lot. There's a buffer of 400 West for the three story condos over there. 400 West is a buffer. The church is a buffer on the, on the north side. So none of them are invading the privacy of residents on Applewood Drive. So I would seriously consider that as you guys make a decision here, how is it gonna affect those residents who have lived here? I know some of them have lived here for 40 years. They made Centerville their home and now they're gonna have people on balconies looking in their backyard and they're losing their privacy. You can not grant the additional units and make them develop it like Jonathan did and put twin homes and make buffers bigger and wider down there. I don't know, I would plead with CW Urban to maybe make an arm called CW Compassion and go into cities after they develop 10, 10 uh, complexes, develop one for the ho homeless and for the less, the poor. You know, there's things that we should be doing in our country, in our cities. Utah, as the governor said, we are a great state. We take care of our people. Are we gonna? I hope so. Maybe if we did, there wouldn't be pandemics on this earth today. And you've got a little taste today. I don't know how many of you know these people that live in the mobile home park, but they've been my friends for 28 years. And they show more Christ-like love to one another than most people I know. And they've taught me how to live like the Savior would live. And I hope you guys will take all that in consideration. Thank you for your service on our city. And I'll turn some time over to my wife. My name is Peggy Earnshaw. Um, I left the meeting because I was on my phone. And anyway, I just wanted to thank you for, can you hear me at all? Yes. I'll, I'll just go ahead and make a short comment. Everything that I wanted to say has been said. Thank you for your time. I know the planning commission um, doesn't handle the public opinion. I appreciate your time listening to all of our um, concerns. I would, I would ask the question of where do we turn to have these concerns on behalf of our friends um, taken care of? What, who can we address? How do we, do we meet with the city council? What, what can be done so that this slap in the face of the $2,000 to, to them? I know that's not the developers, but the city, we, we've got to work as a team. We're willing to do our part. We'll help. Um, form a citizen task group, whatever we need to do to help each one of these people individually, but I don't know how to do that through the, the city channels. And I would appreciate um, some input on how we do that rather than through the planning commission. Thank you for your time. You've been very respectful tonight with everyone's comments and I appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you both for your comments. Uh, I, I can't answer your question here in this meeting, but that's something that um, we can try to look into on the city side and, and hopefully you know, provide what guidance the city can. Um, for tonight, and we're just limited to, to addressing this application that's in front of us. So um, in the spirit of trying to get through, everyone will go ahead and move to the next person, which is Marnell Knight. And on deck is Melissa Hunt. Okay, can you hear me? Yes, we can. If you could just okay. state your name and your city of residence for us, please. Well, it's Marnell Knight and I am a resident of Centerville City. And I just wanted to, my comment is really short in that I appreciate hearing these comments and, and I'm thankful to everybody here who has pulled together as a community that we can help maybe these people. And, and that's all I have to say. Thank you, we appreciate your comments. Next up is Melissa Hunt on deck is Melissa Therian.
Leah, Melissa is um, still. Oh, there, there we go. go. Sorry, it had muted me. <laughs> um, hi, my name is Melissa Hunt and I live on Applewood Drive and I just had a couple of questions. One was concerning the, um, oh my gosh, the 15 foot setback. And according to the research that I've done, and I don't know if anybody else has asked this because I haven't been able to watch all night, but uh, the 15 foot setbacks that people have been commenting on um, obviously are not what we would prefer. But in the code, in the city code that I was able to find, it said that there are, that, the, that it's 20 feet, uh, that the code is 20 feet, but in the, site plan, the whatever was posted for the um, well, site plan, it said that 20 feet, it said not applicable or not, yeah, n slash a. So I'm just wondering, one, why it's not applicable to these, why a 20 foot setback is not applicable. And uh, just the two other concerns are uh, that have been mentioned, definitely some sort of traffic study, traffic impact in the area just because it is very busy, um, especially during certain times of the day. So if something that would really pay attention to that uh, could be done, that would be awesome. And then the conditional use permit of granting 12 instead of the eight would, obviously eight would be much more preferable because um, that would lessen just the impact on the area where it's already so congested because of the two, what the frontage road and then 400 West, those get really impacted as well. So that was all that I was wondering. I don't know if anybody else mentioned that, but I wanted to make sure it got looked at. So thank you for your time. Thank you for your comments. And we've made a note with regards to the question you asked about setbacks. So we'll address that when we compile our list of questions at our next meeting. Thank you very much. Um, next up is Melissa Therian. On deck is Nola Nielsen. So if you could just state your state your full name and your city of residence for us. Yes, Melissa Therian. I'm a current resident of North Salt Lake. However, in September of last year, I was a resident of this area. I lived in the twin duplex homes right behind the baseball field. So I passed this trailer home daily for seven years. Um, I, this affects me on a visceral level because of what I went through. I can empathize and sympathize with these folks because the pretty much same thing happened to me. I had been able to rent a home for seven years and send my daughter to Viewmont High. She was a special, special needs student who had been told she may be nothing more than a cashier. And because of the schooling at Viewmont High, she graduated with honors and is now going to be going to the University of Utah, Phi Beta Kappa. She's a smart kid and that schooling system there is the best. And to give people opportunities who may not otherwise have them in that school system, you may not be able to measure it now, but the future will. There are gonna be some wonderful, wonderful things that can come out of these kids that are able to stay in this school system. For my situation, it's no, I've already been through this. So my heart goes out to these people who are scared and don't know what to do. For my situation, it was, I got a letter on my door on the same day I had to admit my autistic child to an inpatient treatment facility because the owner of the home decided he wanted to make more money, which, you know, money talks, right? So <laughs> we essentially had two weeks to undo seven years of our lives of living in this area, driving up and down that frontage road every day. The traffic is definitely an issue. But my point is that, you know, when you affect someone's lives, you know, in this way, it, it's a really hard thing. I personally wouldn't be able to sleep at night if I had to make this decision. And I hope you and the developer can, can indulge this thought for a moment and say, right now, business as we know it has changed. Um, my education is in business and in criminal justice, and I've been a licensed private detective on and off for the state of Utah for about probably 17 years now. Um, I know there's something called the letter of the law and the spirit of the law. And I think that that should be pretty heavily weighed in this decision. And I think the nuances of this should really be looked at. Um, 
this developer, if they do end up buying this, has an opportunity right now. There are companies like Crocs, silly as they are, they're still company. Anyway, there are companies like Crocs companies and other ones, the ones that I work for who are actually stepping up right now and really, really showing that they deserve to still be in business. And I think that there are those that are going to be on the right side of history and there are those that are going to be not. I truly believe that. And I think that if this developer is able to actually help create a situation where these people can be truly helped and not feel so scared, especially during a terrifying time. This happened to me in September of 2019. If it was happening now, I'm not even sure if I would make it through because dealing with autism, that's a whole nother level of uncertainty. And I've, I heard at least one of the citizens talking about having, having some autism in their families that they're dealing with. And I can tell you from my personal experience that that is an extraordinarily difficult thing to deal with. Maybe maybe you have some experience with it. Um, excuse me. Anyway, I'm, <clears throat> this subject really, really hit home for me. And I want to tell these residents that I stand behind you. And I personally would like to do anything I can. And I know that another man brought up, you know, getting some of the citizens together and seeing if we can help these people because it's the right thing to do. I know that progress has to happen. And business is business, because again, I'm a business major. That's what I do. I understand it. But I'm also pretty big on ethics. And I think that we really have to consider the current world situation that we're in. And if anything, this plan, if it's going to be able to go through, you need to give these people a little bit more time to prepare for this, because <laughs> I had two weeks. And I ended up getting stuck into an apartment where I still every day have to hear cries from a little autistic six-year-old child who doesn't understand why she can't have her old bedroom back, you know, who, when she's upset, just wants to go home and she can't go there anymore. And I cannot even put into words, I can't even put into words how that feels. And I realize that you guys have to go by your laws and your rules. And I get that. And I understand that. And I am not thinking that any one of you are terrible or bad people. I believe that every single one of you on this decision board have a heart. I truly believe that. But again, I really hope I can implore you to really listen, really listen to your heart on this one and really, really dig deep on this one. And the developer, the people that own this, <clears throat> there's other options. You could come out on top of this being a company that people want to go ahead and boost up and say, wow, look what they did. Look what they did at a time when they didn't have to do something. That's a good company. Those are the businesses that are going to survive this pandemic. That's a business fact. And I really hope that that's strongly considered. On behalf of my daughter, who was also in line here, but she had to go. Um, she was able to graduate from Viewmont High. I worked really hard. I came from an upbringing that girls like me don't end up where I do. I had to work very, very hard to get where I am. And to be able to let my child go to Centerville High, Centerville Junior Heights, and to graduate from Viewmont with honors, that is something that I am truly proud of and that it has changed her life for the better. When she's in school and when she's graduated with her environmental science degree next year, and she can go ahead and come and you know, help make this state even better than it already is, again, that, that's something to be proud of and that's something to be said. I understand progress, but... I don't feel like this is it. We appreciate your comments. So we tried to allot everybody five minutes and I've been trying to give people a little bit of leeway, but we've got a couple more in the queue. So understood. thank, thank you, you for I your apologize. comments. And no, if you want to um, provide additional comments, you're welcome to do that in writing. Thank you. Um, so thank you very much. All right, next up is Nolan Nielsen on deck is RA7309. Hi, my name is Nolan Nielsen. And I live in Farmington, Utah, except I am very vested in the mobile park. 20 years ago, I helped my oldest son obtain a home there when he couldn't afford anything else. And we bought number seven. Everything I wanted to say has already been said. And I want to say again that this is an eviction during a pandemic. And I want to echo everything that Jerry Hatch has said and Jonathan 
and Melissa that just said uh, the thing she said about protecting the residents and being part of committee. I thank you for your uh, time and for listening to the comments and I will be writing my comments and sending it into the office on further um, about our story. Thank you. Thank you very much. Up next, RA7309 on deck, Randy Farrell. Leah, can you unmute RA7309? Are we there? Yes, okay. If you could just state your, state your name and your city of residence before you get started, please. Alan Rolfing, and I'm on Applewood Drive. I've been here 40 years. Um, I have heard a lot of good comments tonight. Uh, nothing really other than to add, I'm concerned about the setback. Um, noticing the deck height of the houses that are 15 feet off the fence line, uh, stepping out into the backyard. If anyone were on the deck, they would be in, uh, have full view of the whole lot. So kind of uh, ruins the privacy of the yard. Uh, additionally, we do have a lot of traffic with all of the businesses on the frontage road and with Colonial Lumber and the car wash and uh, the apartments on the off of 4th West. So adding several hundred more cars is definitely going to impact the traffic. And as Jonathan stated, Applewood Drive is kind of an overflow street for people that are uh, frustrated with the traffic on Parish Lane and choose to commute across uh, Applewood Drive to make their way. So I think uh, the imp traffic impact study really does need to be done uh, when we're not dealing with the COVID, uh, COVID uh, situation. Other than that, there's been some great comments tonight and thank you for your uh, diligence in putting this together. Uh, I think there's been some great comments made. Thank you for your comments. Uh, moving right along, we have Randy Farrell up and Robin Nelson Nielsen on deck. Actually, Leah, I think that you unmuted Robin Nielsen. Okay, well, let's see, hold on, sorry. Please pause for a moment. Let's do Randy Farrell. Thank you, Randy okay. Farrell, Bountiful City. And uh, we have a family member that lives in the uh, park and just uh, uh, got to know many of the neighbors there as well as the surrounding area. And uh, just wonderful people. And I just hope that the city will mitigate for the citizens. It's really the community, uh, which is a family made of the citizens. And uh, I'm sure that uh, they'll come together to hopefully help them uh, in, in what they need. And grateful for the comments that have been made and for the service uh, of the community. And we'll submit everything else in writing. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Next up, Robin Nielsen on deck, Tara Rollins. Hello, um, my name is Robin Nielsen. I actually live in Syracuse, but my brother and my nephew live at the park. Um, he is fully disabled. The trailer that he lives in, he's been there for 21 years. And my mother, our, our mother actually used her savings to help buy him that home because of his low income status. Uh, when they moved there, it was a very nice park. And as soon as he passed away and his sons took over, it began to be run down. And when their lot was increased by double, they continued to pay because it's the only place that they can go to. They have nowhere else to go. Um, I'm, I'm gonna read because otherwise I'll lose my track. Um, the community residents have taken the responsibility to make the best of what they have. They pay their higher rent lots because they have no place else. Most of their homes cannot be moved. It's not just losing their homes, it's also losing most or all of their belongings if they are made to leave. Families will be displaced. Many people will become homeless or they may be even split up. In the case of my brother and my nephew, 
they will have to split between my home and my mother's home because they can't stay together. So families are going to be broken. Um, everyone there is low income. Utah says it's such a great place to live. And yet this kind of thing happens. My own home is going to be bulldozed down for a road. So <laughs> the displacement is going to be twice for my brother. The traffic there, it is a big concern. The roads are already congested. People cut through neighborhoods already when they're not happy about waiting in line. And the pedestrians are going to be more and more in danger. Um, I would like to second the motion that Mr. Lysenko made to create a committee. I think that's a wonderful idea. I think that the developers are looking at this from a business point of view, which is normal because our world runs on money. Everything's bottom line, even for the city, you're looking at a higher tax base and I get that, but you can't buy lives. You can't, shouldn't be able to sell lives. These people that we saw from the from the community, these elderly people who've spent all that they have, the disabled people who will become street homeless people or in shelters and lose all that they've got. There's got to be a different way. There's got to be something that we can do to help them. My brother and my nephew are lucky. Yes, they'll probably be split up if this goes through but at least they'll have a roof over their heads and, and we will spend whatever we need to do to feed them and help them and, and hopefully store some of their things. But so many other people will have nothing left. They'll die homeless. My mother is 81 years old and she just had to move and her health has gone so far downhill from all the stress and the anxiety and all this pandemic and everything else that's happened with her. And I saw that resident, that 88 year old woman and, and my heart just broke. People like that are not gonna survive this. Please just be human. I, I know you are, and I'm not saying that to be rude in any way, but there has to be a line that is drawn where business cannot cross over mm. and destroy compassion. And that's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Uh, next up, Tara Rollins on deck, Ted Westover. Hello, can you I, hear me? Yes, we can hear you just fine. If you'll just state your name and your um, city of residence, please. Absolutely. My name is Tara Rollins, and I'm the executive director of the Utah Housing Coalition, and I do, I live in Cottonwood Heights. Um, thank you. I want to say thank you to Jonathan Lazenko and Mark Earnshaw for your comments. I was devastated to hear in the front end of this conversation about the vis um, visitor parking and not the displacement of the residents. We understand the park needs upgrading of its infrastructure, curb appeal. The biggest issue for me is these are natural occurring affordable housing. Centerville has no deed restricted housing. People can afford. Centerville has nothing to offer these residents. In terms of housing, they can afford. Centerville have not invested in affordable housing. My question is, has Centerville encourage development of affordable housing? How many projects have been brought to the planning commission and denied? We need to develop a plan to help these residents 
have the best outcome for this situation. They have been community members for a long time. And I really feel that the city needs to investigate funding that is available to help these um, people that will be displaced. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Next up, Ted Westover on deck, Teresa Hoskins. Hi there, I'm Ted Westover. I live in number three. Can you guys hear me? Yes, we can. Uh, I lived here for, for 30 years. I moved in here with my wife and raised three sons here. And I don't, I don't know what this is gonna do any good. You know, I, I, I really don't know what this is all about, why we're doing all this. To, I know that we need to save our homes. Uh, we can, uh, we, we bought a home and we can move out, but uh, it's, it, it's, it's expensive. People come by, we try to sell it. People come by to, to buy it and they, they find how much it costs to move out. It's 14,000 and up. And you know, it's, this is a nice home. And uh, I want to live here for three more years until I retire and then, do what I wanted to do with my retirement years, but me and my wife. But I just don't know what what else to even say to you to, to let them know that that people here depended upon this housing. I've seen a lot in this trailer park. I've been the manager for some years in the past, and I've seen it go from good to bad. And I don't know what you 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 guys can do about it. But we need to know who we can talk to, like like Peggy said. Who we could talk to to help get this get it straight. Uh, I love living in Centerville. I lived here, like I said, for half my life. I've gone to church with these guys and 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 played ball with them and worked and served. We've been here in this trailer park. We picked it up. The ward and our neighbors next door to us have been here fixing the trailer park up, fixed potholes, uh, fixed the basketball court, fixed the little park for the kids. And it's all for the people who live in the trailer park. And we owe it to them. We owe it to them who can't help themselves. Those of us who can, we owe it to them to help them. And uh, that's what we have to do. Ms. Eccles, 88 years old. Uh, Prudy's 88 years old. You know, the number of people that are older can't, they need help. But we need to help them, those of us who can. And I know you planning commission, you don't, it's not your responsibility. I don't what I what I understand, but maybe you know somebody who, who is their responsibility to help us out. And I, I just want to know, let you know that that we do need help. We can't help ourselves right now. And I hope that you can find someone or in your heart to, to help us out. And that's what I have to say. Thank you. We appreciate your comments. Next up is Teresa Hoskins on deck, Valerie Moody. Hi, can you see me? Sure can. If you'll just state your full name for us and your city of residence, please. Okay. Um, my name is Teresa Lyde Hoskins, and I live in the Centerville Mobile Estates. I live in Trailer 23. Um, um, let me see. Um, so my husband and I, so I, I moved to Centerville when I, in 1969. I've lived here for 50 years of my life. Um, I grew up on Porter Lane um, when it was um, alfalfa fields and the Williams farm was right across the street. They had a dairy there. Anyway, um, went to, went to Centerville Junior High, graduated from Viewmont, married my husband. Um, he enrolled in the Army and uh, we lived for in Maryland while he served as a military police during Desert Storm. After his four years, um, we wanted to come back home to Utah and raise our two young children here and we were looking for a place in a, a good community 
that had good schools and um I loved Centerville it was where I grew up I thought it was the best city in the whole world um we happened to see that there was a little empty lot in this little Centerville trailer park and we contacted the owner and met with the owner and interviewed and we were afraid we were not going to pass his interview but he was awesome um he loved the park he was very strict um but you knew he loved you and you knew he was had only the best interest for you and the park itself um when he passed away um his sons took over and for the first couple of years it was okay ish and it slowly started not being quite so okay anymore um uh, um anyhow I'll, we um so to get our first trailer here um we found a single wide in north salt lake that we really loved the trailer we could afford it but we wanted to live here at this lot that was empty in centerville and so we um gathered our money together that we'd saved and um, we're able to pay the $5,000 to move it from North Salt Lake to here and um, moved in and we were so happy, so excited. My, our oldest son was six and our youngest daughter was three and um, life was great. And um, then, um, uh, a few years after living there, our youngest son was born, Jeffrey, and he he has autism. But um, when he was about three years old, um, we decided to save up our money and we um, replaced our single wide mobile home with a double wide modular home um, with the hopes that someday in the future we would find a piece of land that we would be able to put the home on the land and own it um, and the land. Um, in, in the meantime, life happened and um, our oldest son became very ill after his LDS mission. Um, anyway, he, my eldest son, after it was probably six years worth of not knowing what was going on health-wise with him, he did pass away um, at the age of 28. Um, in August of 2012, and um, sorry. Um, and then um, a year after Josh had passed away, our youngest son, the one with autism, um, was diagnosed with um, testicular cancer that had moved, was in his lymph nodes in his abdomen, and. Uh, he had just barely turned 19. And so um, he had to have surgery to remove his testicle. And then he had to go through some really intense um, chemotherapy. And so uh, that kind of side blinded us financially wise. But um, anyhow, he finished his treatment. And then, um, and then, um, Four years ago, our only other remaining child, um, our only daughter, Lacey, um, passed away also, and she was 28. She had a, a rare autoimmune disorder. And um, so we never quite was a, were able to come up with the funds to uh, move our home to a piece of land because um, life just sort of happened and life was pretty sucky. And um, anyway, just we, not, well, we thought that this would be our home. I don't know what more to say. I just, our lives are just shattered. I know that there's only so much you guys can do. I hope there's a way that for the people who, especially who don't have any soft place to land. I really worry about a lot of my neighbors here. Um, 
that don't have any resources. Um, and I, I just hope that there's a, a way that all sides can win that, I don't know, I don't know. It's just, it's just hard. So. Well, we appreciate your comments. We're coming up on that time limit again, and I, I don't mean to cut you off, but you're, we appreciate your comments and you're certainly welcome to submit um, any additional comments that you may have in writing to the city. So thank you very much. Okay. Moving to our last um, person is Valerie Moody. And I know that I said that we were going to cut things off at 10, but we're, we're down to our last, our last um, commenter. So let's just go ahead and we'll finish this out. So um, Ms. Moody, if you'll state your full name for us and your city of residence, please. Hi, my name is Valerie Marie Moody and I live in Layton and I am vice president of Utah Coalition of Manufactured Homeowners. And what I'm hearing tonight isn't any different than what I've been, I, I'm tired of flying across the country to help people fight for their homes. Uh, Utah is really lagging. We have things we can do in our state to protect us. I've heard several people say, we should do something, what can we do? What we can do is encourage lawmakers to pass the first right of refusal, which means the mobile home residents would have the right to buy the property first before any developers. It also gives the mobile home community owners the right to refuse whatever offer. Utah has fabulous grants. There's a place in Murray, a mobile home community that was able to purchase theirs and it's now a resident owned commu community. Um, I've heard some people say that maybe Centerville Estates has turned into an eyesore. Layton City has code enforcement laws on the books for our mobile home communities. Centerville City can do the same thing. There's options here. I know that Utah lawmakers, planning commission, city council, nobody wants to tell a landowner what they can and can't do with their land. I'm not asking you guys to do that. I'm asking you maybe to take a step back and see that there are rules we can put in place, laws we can put in place to protect these residents. Most people that live in mobile home communities, you've heard from these people, they've lived here 20 something years. This is their part of the American dream that they have. They've put work into their homes. And unfortunately, Utah's running out of space in most of our communities. My community is full. We have no empty lots. Um, we took in a lot when Clearfield Mobile Home Community closed. And there's maybe, I think I can get you the numbers, two mobile home movers in Utah. And they really don't like to move, honestly, anything that's older than the late 90s. I mean, they just don't. They, they're prone to falling apart when they move. There's just a lot of issues and $2,000 in today's world doesn't go far for anyone to be able to move into anything and affordable housing is just at a premium in our state. It's unfortunate, we just don't have a lot of it. So there are options. I hope you guys consider those options. I hope that everyone has listened to the residents and I thank you guys for allowing me the time to speak even though I know it's past 10. So thank you for your time. Thank you, we appreciate your comments. And with that, seeing no one else in line to comment, I'm gonna close the public hearing. Um, we will invite, Corey is popping up. So I am going to turn the time over to Corey if you would like to say something before we, I was gonna invite the applicant to step forward. Did you wanna address us first, Corey? No, I've written down a number of the questions and I'll just compare them with everybody else's notes and then we'll put together a, a sheet for the next meeting. Fantastic. I, I do want to give the applicant the opportunity to respond if they would like to do so. Leah, can you unmute? All right, there we go. Uh, Ms. Carter, you're welcome to respond if you would like to. Okay, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, um, well, I appreciate the opportunity to respond. Um, I think probably the only thing that's appropriate for me to say right now is that um, we did hear your voice tonight. Um, we have a detailed note of every single person who spoke, where they live, um, and we are going to figure out um, some solutions for all. I don't know what those will be, but um, I do believe that um, 
based on the feedback tonight that we are going to take some action. So um, I appreciate the opportunity to listen to everyone's feedback and um, for the residents of the Centerville Mobile Estates, um, you will most likely be hearing from somebody from our company or myself directly. So if you see us knocking on your door and trying to understand a little bit more about your situation, we appreciate um, you being able to communicate directly with us. We will also be launching some other forms of communication via Facebook and handwritten letters because I know technology is um, not the best way to communicate for all the residents. And so we are going to go about multiple ways to communicate with the residents to figure out um, what their needs are and see um, what additional solutions we can come up with to um, help. So that's all I have. Thank you. Uh, commissioners, any questions for the applicant? No, okay. Um, we, we appreciate your comments. So um, I recognize that a lot of people are being impacted by this proposed development. And on behalf of the Planning Commission, I want to say thank you. We appreciate everyone's comments. We appreciate people for sharing their concerns and um, for sharing their personal stories. We know that this is a weighty matter and it's something that the Planning Commission takes very seriously. As I mentioned at the outset, unfortunately, we're not a legislative body. Um, we're an administrative one, and so we have limited authority. Our job is to apply the ordinances uh, consistent with applicable law, um, and, and we'll do that. But we know that this is an incredibly difficult situation for some of uh, the residents of the Centerville Mobile Estates, and so we really do appreciate your comments. Um, so at this point, uh, consistent with what I had said at the outset, we are going to table this matter for now. Anyone who is listening who hasn't had the opportunity yet to provide comments, you're welcome to provide those in writing. Um, and at the end of this Zoom meeting, in fact, Leah, do you have that available now that you could just put up for anybody who is who is watching the, the information, our one page sheet, there we go, perfect. So you'll see there that you're, you're welcome to drop comments via email to recorder at center, centervilleut.com, or you can put it in the Dropbox that's located on the south side of the parking lot at City Hall. Um, just address it to the Planning Commission Hive development with the, your full name and your city of residence, or you're welcome to mail it as well. Um, and we just ask that you try to do that by May 21st by 5 p.m. So. And then we will um, take this up. We'll review any of the additional written comments that have either already been submitted or that come in between then and May 21st. Um, and those will go into the packet. And like Corey said, if, if you're a straggler and you still want to get your comments in, please still do. Um, and we'll go ahead and take this, um, this matter up again at our next meeting, which is going to be on May 27th. So thank you for everyone. Um, for your comments, we really, we really do appreciate it. We know that this one, this one is a hard one. Um, so, with, just, Corey, did you want? Yes. Can I just say, um, and I Becky, want. I think you're muted. I am not muted. I just want. Um, can anyone else hear Becky? I can. I can. I'm not muted. I don't think. I just wanted to add um, to say that. So the public understands Shaylin is our chair and she speaks for all of our um, the planning commission, but each of us individually as planning commission commissioners appreciate all of the what we've heard tonight. So um, please know that we are united in um, appreciating the public comment and um, the applicant and all of the um, information mm. tonight. So thank you. I think I'm dead. Shailen, I think it's your I'm turn. Out. Hello. Now, just uh, now I can hear everybody. Shailen. Oh my gosh, am I? Can anyone hear me? Yeah. Tell her to just keep talking. Yep. <laughs> I'm done. Keep going. And the technology problem. <laughs> just go ahead. Ah, I made a problem. Sorry. <laughs> we can all hear Shailen, but she Shailen. can't hear us. Talk. <laughs> Thank <sighs> you.
You can hear me, but yes. I can't see anyone else. Hmm. Kevin, okay. Kevin would like you to take this over. This is the fun of technology. Um, yeah. Kevin, since I'm having technical difficulties on my end and you can apparently hear me and I can't hear you, uh, yes. will you move to the next item um, on the agenda? The Community what? Development Director's Report and I'll see if I can't uh, figure out what's going on on my end. Yes, let's do it. Let's go to the Community Development Director's Report and City Council update, Corey. Thank you, just be real quick. Uh, did nothing to report from the City Council as far as actions on any land use or planning matters at this point. Your agenda is scheduled for the 27th. We may have an additional item that night. Uh, we're waiting to payment and completion of their application. So you may have a couple items or it might be reduced to the follow-up from this meeting. And as always, you asked for the inclusion of the goals. COVID-19 seems to have put a little bit of a hiccup in that, but I did list them on the agenda for you. So that's all I have to report unless you have questions. No, I just think that uh, barring some change from the governor and others, we'll probably plan on another Zoom meeting in two weeks. Is that the thought? That's what okay. we anticipate. Yep. Okay, well, I think Shailen dropped off. She may be coming back soon, but in the meantime, let's just keep going. Um, I hope she didn't have any changes or recommended changes for the minutes, but uh, maybe we can get started with that and see if she can catch up to us or something. Is she coming back? No, we're, we're losing people. Now we're starting to talk about minutes. And Oh, here she comes. Maybe we just give it a half a second. I'm really sorry if I messed it up by unmuting myself. So I don't know what I did. Ah. Shaylin, can you hear us now? You're muted. Oh, now can you hear us? Yeah, oh, there I go. Oh my gosh, I'm so sorry. Like everything just froze and I was thinking it's clearly me. My my internet came up and it said it was unstable and I, I apologize, guys. Um, hopefully you could hear me up until Becky started talking because otherwise I was just talking to nothing. Yeah, we could um, hear you great. It was, it was really good. So it's all you to do the minutes. Fantastic. Thank you very much for doing that. Okay. We'll do the minutes like we always do page by page. Um, let me know if you guys have any comments or corrections to these, starting with page one. Page two. Page three. Page four. Page five. Page six. And I guess technically page seven, since there's something on it. <laughs> uh, and the chair will entertain a motion. I move to accept the minutes, the unamended minutes, Ooh. I'd like to say, the unamended minutes from April 8, 2020. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Any further discussion or debate? All those in favor say aye. 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 Anyone opposed say nay, it was unanimous. Um, thank you guys, everyone, I appreciate you. Hopefully we were able to work that through the technological things. I think it worked okay. So appreciate all of you um, and I move that we adjourn. So who wants to claim that? I did, but. All right. Christina. Um, all those in favor say aye. 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 Thanks, guys. I gotta say, you really rocked that. It's hard to. Hey, Lynn, great job. Yes. Yes. That's Thanks. Awesome. Very so well done. Appreciate it, guys. Thank you. Thanks, right. everyone. Bye. Okay. Bye. -bye. Bye.